The following is a conversation with Chris Duffin, the mad scientist of strength. He's one of the strongest people in the world, but is also an engineer of some of the most innovative strength equipment I've ever seen. Check out his company, Kabuki Strength. He is the only person who squatted and deadlifted 1,000 pounds for multiple reps and achieved many other amazing feats of strength. He has lived one hell of a life of hardship and triumph, as he writes about in his book called The Eagle and the Dragon. Quick mention of our sponsors, Headspace, Magic Spoon, Sun Basket, and Ladder. Check them out in the description to support this podcast. As a side note, let me say that I was always a fan of strength, both powerlifting and Olympic weightlifting, both as a fan and practitioner. Mostly, I'm a fan of people who are willing to put in years of hard work towards finding out what the limits of their body is and then smashing past those limits. People like Chris Duffin or on the Olympic weightlifting side, people like Dmitry Klokov. That guy's great. This is why I love watching the Olympics, both the heartbreaks and the triumphs. They all reveal the incredible heights that the human mind and the human body can reach. This is the Lex Friedman Podcast, and here is my conversation with Chris Duffin. You've been a part of several incredible feats of strength. Which was the hardest, or maybe one you're most proud of? Definitely the one I'm most proud of is that journey for the, the grand goals. It was like a five-year scope that I chased this. And so when you think about training, it took more than five years, obviously. I, by that point, I'd been training for over 25 years. But it makes me proud. I mean, there were three distinct things that I wanted to accomplish out of this. So it was really thought out. Um, and this was kind of my exit pro from being a, a competitive lifter mm -hmm. and basically saying, hey, I'm going to be you know, an Instagram lifter, an uh, exhibition lifter, or whatever. I've done this for 16 years. I was number one in the world for like eight years straight, all-time world records. And I'm like, I'm not going to do that anymore. What I want to do is just something deep down to me that is really important. And there's three things that were driving this. And this is a five-year journey that I, that I went through to do this. I really wanted to showcase that you could do something that is well beyond the scope of what people think is humanly possible. So just this inspiration thing, this grand over the top, like if you set your mind to a single-minded goal, you can go so much further. And I didn't even say what the goal was up front because it was so far out there, I would have been laughed at. And that's, I, I think big goals should be kept pretty damn close mm -hmm. uh, to start with for that reason too. Um, but and then the second piece was to, to, to walk the walk, to show like the principles of what I believed in around human movement, mm -hmm. um, the ability to manage and control the spinal mechanics and the output that can have on the body. And so I wanted to take the two most basic movements that every able-bodied person should be able to do. So fundamental movement patterns, the squat, which is like in the developmental approach is around nine months as a baby from a developmental kinesiology uh, standpoint and a really basic pattern that every able-bodied person should be able to master. The other one being the hip hinge, being able to pick something up off the ground, a deadlift. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to do those two, not just one, because I wanted to show the principles that I wasn't uh, built for one. I wasn't a specialist because of my lever links, torso links, all that, any outliers, because nobody had ever done a thousand pound squat. So this is it, is, and a thousand pound deadlift. It was outside of the scope of what anybody's, there's like half a dozen people that have done one or the other, but nobody's ever done both. And I wanted to do something unique. I wanted to do them, not only do it, but do them for reps to leave literally no question out there. And there's no competition for that. Uh, so it was, this is what I'm going to go do. And uh, to pull it off, I had some past issues with my elbows and stuff that I couldn't work around. So I had to wear uh, straps, which was another reason I did, couldn't do it in the competition setting. Mm -hmm. um, so the first year I worked up and I did a thousand and two pound deadlift. We Plates were weighed afterwards. It was a couple, little bit over. And I did it for almost three reps. And that still stands as a Guinness world record. The, just the one rep does <laughs> is the most weight ever sumo deadlifted. And 
One other person has deadlifted a thousand for reps at this point, and that was uh, Thor Bjornsson mm -hmm. uh, from Game of Thrones. He's done a thousand for a double as well. So mm -hmm. then the next four years, and I did a bunch of feats of strength on the way, but it was all about building that axial loading capacity, the strength that, because now I'm moving the weight from my hands up to my shoulders. Mm -hmm. And so to do it for reps is like so much harder than a single, like five to 10 seconds versus 30 plus seconds to be able to buffer and manage all that with that kind of load is just crazy. So it's literally about the duration that your body is carrying the load. Yeah. That's a big part of it. Yeah. Because you have to, you're using the, the resource of the diaphragm for stabilization. And so it, it's also responsible for respiration and all this other stuff. So even when you're not squatting, you've got to be handling those loads. Just holding that weight is fascinating. It's like, it's fascinating that the human body can do that, can, can maintain that structure, just everything working together, that the biology, the skeletal structure, the, the musculature on top of that can hold the weight. It's yeah. fascinating to watch. Everything is very intentful about positioning and how you're creating pressure and all this sort of stuff, especially for me. So when I mentioned that half a dozen people have squatted it and half a dozen people have deadlifted it, you understand those people all weigh 380 to 440 mm -hmm. pounds. I weighed 265 to 285, depending on the where I was between the two. Uh, so there's that as well, right? So big, big difference. And uh, over the course of that, I did a, a lot of other feats of strength that fit in that uh, capacity, and we can skip over those, but that was hugely invested as far as, you know, <laughs> what I put into being able to accomplish that. Because it's it's over the top, which means the other stuff had to, to shift, and I had to learn. So, like, there's so many things that came into place to pull that off. And so, yeah, last March, two days before the world shut down, I did it. It was supposed to be at the largest equipment exhibition in the world down in San Diego uh, as an event. And that got shut down a week beforehand, obviously. So we moved to, let's do it in my gym and invite people. And that was on a Saturday. And Thursday or Friday, they limited it to 25 people for gatherings. I did it on Saturday. And then Monday, everything <laughs> shut down. So wow. it was kind of surreal for yeah. timing wise, right? And so if I hadn't done it, it would have never got done. Hmm. Like, because I... I'd push to the limit. I couldn't come back and do it. It was at the total limitation of my capabilities. So I'm so, pretty I'm pretty proud of it. Oh, and the last piece was uh, every one of these feats along the way, I collaborated with a charity that I believed in. And there was a lot of those tied to my life story, mm -hmm. uh, which I'm, we probably will get into. Yes. Um, so it was threefold. So that inspiration piece, inspiration, motivation, walking the walk and showing like just the, these methodologies that a guy that had to learn to walk again can do something like this with no back pain. If you, if you, the, it, there is a way. And the third one is, is to provide awareness and recognition around a lot of, um, key charity. So, so your heart was in this journey, but also your mind, which is, you're like a scholar of strength, a scientist of strength, an engineer of strength for reps, do a thousand pounds of squat and deadlift. Let's first, talk through the actual day you did it. What does it take to lift that much for reps? The day of is really easy. <laughs> the, really? the lift itself, other than a few seconds, is really easy and not challenging. People always ask me, what was it like? How beat up were you after that and the deadlift? And the simple fact is it was easy. The work to get there was horrendous. So, so even the psychology of the day, you I, weren't, there was not a fear, there was not a nervousness, there was not a doubt in your mind. Uh, there were certainly doubts on that day um, from some training history. So there was some major breaks to my confidence in the couple months leading up where I had issues with passing out under the bar. So completely losing consciousness. And this was on weight less than a thousand pounds even. So that was like all this buildup in me going, what if, yeah. what if it, I think I have this resolved, but what if I get up there and I can't even do a rep? How embarrassing will this be that I've been talking about this and planning for this for so long? But outside of that, I knew I could do it. In fact, I wanted to do even more, even up to the, the second rep. Training is about, you know, working into a fatigue state. So you're building uh, an amount of fatigue 
in your system. And then when you let off of it, that's when you get a compensation. And that's how you stair stop training. This is periodization. But leading into a big event, you're accumulating this massive amount of fatigue. And so I was performing at a level that I could do it. And so I knew I was going to be able to on meet because then you, then you give yourself that window to be able to recover and super compensate and be able to do a little bit more. So like that first rep when I did it, strength wise, I went, I could do this for five reps. Like it went through my <laughs> head. I'm like, feeling. I mean, it was easy and it was fast and it felt like amazing. And I'm like, I'm going to crush this. And then set rep two, uh, the realization kicked in is like, oh, this is for reps with a thousand pounds on your back and you're fatiguing just like, and then the third one was every last thing I could muster to just finish. I mean, and I just barely got it done because it's, the strength <laughs> is like there, but like that capacity yeah. to be able to manage all those resources for that amount of time. Cause it's not just leg strength when we're talking about this stuff. So what does it take to go from the, <laughs> from, I don't know what, no, like from 500 to a thousand, that feels like a journey that's like exponential. It's, it it, it is. Like it gets hard. exponentially harder. It does. In the early 2000s, like I said, I started lifting in 1988. Um, but my first meet in the early 2000s, my my max deadlift uh, was 523, and my first squat was 550. So, uh, frame Guess of reference. That's a heck of a journey. Okay. It is a journey. <laughs> For people that are, like to lift, what should they understand about the difference between doing 500 and 1,000? in terms of the actual lift that you were experiencing that day, in terms of the mechanics, in terms of all the things you have to be, like the neurological adaptation you mentioned, the breathing, the core strength, what like techniques, like little tricks, mm -hmm. psychological tricks, anything that kind of stands out to you. The level of intent and the opportunity for error are at a different level. So just the minutest changes of position by quarter inch, half inch can be make or break wow. at that level. So these things, everything gets amplified. So the ability to, to start with having the, the pelvis just in the right orientation to the diaphragm before we start initiating what we call the, the eccentric loading of the abdominal cavity to create this intra-abdominal pressure of working against this outward expansion working against the outer sheath of abdominal, thoracolumbar musculature, obliques, um, causing the co-contraction at the pelvic floor, all this stuff and how you cue that, because you can't think about all this stuff. You need to break it down and distill and practice to like it's one simple cue that we now lock down and control this torso stability, because this is what these fundamental movements are about, is being able to control our spinal mechanics and then now be able to maintain that while articulating the joints around that through a range of motion uh, and then using the main power drivers. So in this instance, both instances, it's the, you know, the hip complex to generate that power and transfer it from how we're rooted and connected to the floor through to the distal end you know, which would be the barbell on the shoulder. You know, there's a couple key concepts. So one is that what we just talked through is how to actually maintain that stability. So if you have either the diaphragm, so uh, which is connected at the rib cage, so out of alignment in any position, it needs to be in alignment with the pelvic, uh, the pelvis. So those two in opposition. So this is simple engineering here mm -hmm. um, because what we're gonna do is eccentrically load this. We're gonna use the diaphragm just like you would in a diaphragm pump mm -hmm. where it's gonna press down on all the tissue in there. So we're not using breath. Mm -hmm. So our breath was actually a lot of times a default pattern when people do that because they'll bring it into their chest and raise uh, their rib cage. So um, what we wanna do is just initiate the diaphragm. Air can be used as well over the top at the final to create just a little bit more downward pressure. But if we have out of alignment there, we have uh, a, a pressure get leak where it's going to be push out the front or the rear if you're either in flexion or extension, all right? And then that causes this co-contraction and all this pressure of, of, of uh, the organs essentially against outward against all those tissue for the co-contraction as well as surrounding the spine to be able to stabilize that. And then it puts all the muscles on both sides of the body in what we call the, the, the best length tension relationship. So if you think about a curl and we reach our arm out at the extended length, 
our bicep is not as strong and then all the way in the curl position, it's not as strong. There's somewhere in here that's yeah. this control of both. And so when you're sitting there arched or bent over, we have muscles that are past either one of those ranges. So they've got a lot of tension, which then will create relaxation on the other side, right? So we want to have, and all of that needs to be working. Mm -hmm. And now the next important thing is the foot. So it's actually this connection to the ground and how we're actually using the foot and ankle complex to grab and grip this connection to the ground and elicit uh, an effect. And because of this and then the everything between will naturally kind of do what it needs to do. So people like to focus on knee knee position or how far out their hips are or all this other stuff, uh, which is outputs of this. So if we control the torso and the knee, the only thing that can happen from that point is for the squat to happen. All right. Um, so this allows us to use this massive, you know, the hip complex for all the muscles around that that are built to drive through hip extension to complete the squat. I did actually miss one thing in there. So this torso, people often miss uh, the lat is a spinal stabilizer as well. Mm -hmm. So that's key in controlling uh, function at the the uh, TL junction, um, which is um, just above the, the lumbar spine. So kind of right opposite uh, where your sternum is. And you'll see people kind of roll over sometimes like in an Olympic squat or something like that where they lose position. Um, and that's often because they're close grip because you can't engage the lats very well that way and they're pushing up in the bar. But you want to be able to drive and pull the bar to your center and that's going to create and use the lats now to drive and connect the shoulder into this. And we're kind of compressing and tightening all this stuff towards that center to create that entire torso stability. That's why I was using torso stability, not just core stability uh, in my conversation earlier. Torso stability. Okay, so there's all these like modules yeah. of the body then connected to the grounding with like your feet on the ground. Everything you're speaking to, how do you work each of those modules? Is this over time you kind of develop the feel that ultimately boils down to this one simple cue that you mentioned? Or do you, can you like literally study each particular module in yourself and see how it affects the lift? So the best way, and I believe it's because I hate just like people getting out and just doing just movement stuff and not actually adding load because we only adapt when there's load. Maybe we can get some, you know, some proprioception or awareness of position and other stuff doing some, some corrective patterns and other stuff. But this is basic physiology is that there must be an imposed demand for us to have adaptation. And this is mental, this is emotional, this is all, all these areas. Um, but, and, and people miss that. So I prefer to be able to look at a person, and this is our, our methodology, and do the assessment in any basic loaded movement. So with developing an eye for that, you can actually see and go, okay, we've got a fault pattern right here in the foot and use a cue or a set of cues. Doesn't really matter till we find the one that works and bring that. And now we know we want to simplify this stuff. I just walked through. That sounds really complicated. And it, it is, if we try to break down and distill it all, but like, let's just find the basic stuff that gets us in the range, start working and then find the next, as we add load. Mm -hmm. Now we find where's our next area that we're starting to fault at and then go there again next. So this is what we do, what we teach in our educational platform. So we are the only, I believe everybody wants to do a lot of these like uh, assessments, mm -hmm. you know, on a bench, on a table, body, and and it's like, no, let's let's go squat, let's go deadlift. If you do strongman and it's a yoke carry, let's yoke carry because these are basic human fundamentals. It's not powerlifting. Mm -hmm. Like this is how we function. This is why we we work with twenty nine of the thirty major league baseball teams and ninety percent of all professional sports out there uh, in North America. Sorry, although we do some work with Tour de France and other stuff as well. Um, and uh, North America, I do mean hockey too. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Great. But uh, these principles, of, like you know, if if the Dodgers won't bring us in, they're not learning how to power lift. Mm -hmm. You know, we're gonna obviously we'll probably be do we do a little bit more uh, shoulder focus than hip focus with their athletes or their coaches. We're usually working with the coaches, not the athletes. And so you help them, and then the same thing on yourself un to understand the role that these different muscle groups have. Yes, on the holistic. Yeah. Lift. So it's all about getting the joints in the appropriate position so that we can that we can manage load so that we're not putting undue stress on the joint. We're getting the proper length tension. We're getting these basic fundamental things with the body. And so the, the largest global impact that you will have is 
through spinal mechanics. I can't look at a shoulder if I'm not managing this because it's your spine. So for those that are just listening, like I'm arching and then and then flexing, um, that's going to affect shoulder extension, flexion, all these sorts of things. So it could even affect things down of what's looking at dorsiflexion issues on the foot. Like, And then that's why I go to the foot next because it has the second largest global impact. And then from there, now I'm going to look at the big energy drivers, which is be hip complex, shoulder complex. And then we can start looking at kind of the peripheral things, but usually that's some sort of output of the other, but the knees, the elbows, the things like that. So it's all about getting the stack, which affects neurology. So let's talk in engineering terms. You get in a car, modern car today, and a lot of them will have this traction control button in there. And there's a big misconception that, you know, I'm, I'm out and it's, it's snowy or here in Austin, only rainy. Well, it probably doesn't rain much, but you're going around a corner, start slipping. It's like, oh, it's going to send the powers from the wheels that are slipping to the ones that are gripping mm -hmm. and keep me from crashing and dying a fiery death. Mm -hmm. Well, that's not how it works. It's the exact same. We've got, we've got, the, we've got the tires, which are our foot, you know, the connection to the ground, right? We've got the power driver, which is, you know, the, the engine, the transmission delivering, you know, the power through it. And we've got the stability or suspension. And then we have the neurology. And what the neurology is doing, it's sensing that we don't have good stability or a loss of connection somewhere. And so I need to save you from crashing and hurting yourself. Mm -hmm. And so it goes to the engine and says, let's retard the timing. Let's reduce the shift patterns. And we're just reducing the power output. Mm -hmm. And that's straight how the human body works. So when I do this stuff, it's actually uh, affecting that. I mean, I can take somebody and do some minute changes with the neck position at the thoracic outlet, okay? And immediately see an enhancement in power output. And I can measure it. We measure this stuff uh, with uh, velocity uh, devices and see like an, a 10% boom, jump. And so if you think about that, what about all your training through the years where you actually had additional capacity but you weren't using it because your traction control was on. Now you figure this out stuff and now you start stacking it. And now you can see so much greater. So it's not just injury prevention. This is performance and mm -hmm. additive performance over time. This is huge. And people don't really think about this stuff, but we can turn that stuff off, which is actually going to also, again, make us, make us safer. But what we want to do is the performance tune race car. Do they have a traction control button? No, they got some amazing tires to grip the ground, a performance tuned suspension. And that driver's going to put what his foot to the metal. He's going to mm -hmm. put it to the floor. Okay. That's a performance vehicle. Mm -hmm. That's what we want to be. I want to continue on that line. Uh, but first I have to ask, like, how did it feel to accomplish the grand goal? Oh my God. Okay. When you just stand back. Oh my thousand pounds for reps. what did it feel like? Anybody can go watch the video. <laughs> online um it's well filmed by the way got me all like excited <laughs> oh well the the movies so we actually have the final footage of that the good footage not mm -hmm. posted yet so it's literally just an instagram video or a phone video right now they're the only one online yeah the, the, it's on your youtube channel but it's dramatic yes it's, it is yeah <laughs> came out just time to the music perfectly yeah, too yeah. which is i listened to some odd music uh which there's some reason behind that okay um but <laughs> Um, I liked it though. It was great. It does, You're saying it does there's work. full length footage. There's a documentary, documentary that's it's got a little slowed because of COVID because it's also a backstory of the Eagle and the Dragon, my book, mm -hmm. about why I do kind of the things that I've done in my life, or that's what I'm assuming the director's working on. I don't really have <laughs> the control of the movie, right? Uh, yeah. But <laughs> but okay, but, but the video is okay, incredible. How, how did it feel? How did it feel? I started crying. It was overwhelming to have worked so intensely and so long and hard at something that pushed every ounce of me to the limit that, and, and I did it. I'm so I'm getting a little emotional. I, I did exactly what I said I was going to fucking do. Yeah. Like, and it was, it was overpowering. I mean, I was just crying uncontrollably, um, but just with a mixture of, I, I, I don't know what the, the mixture of emotions is hard to explain because um, it was the completion of something. It was a new phase of my life. It, I, I mean, there's so many things here. So one, you set an impossible goal and you accomplished it. One, 
Two is like on the broader humanity aspect, like how many humans in this world accomplish perfection in a particular direction required to do this. So like so, you're basically and, representing like uh, one little like, like little glimmer of excellence of the human spirit. There's always more. So understand this. <laughs> This is a basic <laughs> fundamental. You yeah. can always do better. There is no such thing as perfection. You yeah. could always, there is always yeah. more. So anytime you reach something, any amazing workout or accomplishment in life, could you have put more into it? Could you? Yeah. Yes. But here's the thing. <laughs> I left on my terms. I said, this is it. I'm going to work towards, I've been training for 30 years. I'm gonna do this thing that is, un like I couldn't even say that I was gonna do it years before. I'm gonna do it and then I'm done. And I didn't leave from an injury. I wasn't forced, to, I wasn't, I left on, I did exactly what I said. I, I, I went to a level that I, I left on my terms and that's unique. Cause that's usually not the case. Usually you kind of either taper out or it doesn't matter, I'm talking like, anything in life in general, right? Like um, you taper out, you fail, you hurt, like you, lo you lose a job, like something, you know, you roll into retirement, like you You've accomplished it. something truly great and you walked away in your own terms. Is there a sadness completing something like that? Because it's, it's in one perspective, the greatest thing you'll ever do. And like when you accomplish such a great height, in some sense, you have to face your mortality at that point. So good question, but it is certainly not the greatest thing that I'll ever do. It's the greatest physical There's street always I'll more. ever do. <laughs> the greatest physical, <laughs> yes. Uh, but that was an expression of some of my values and the mm. way that I want to live. It was a way of expressing it. So understanding that is hugely fundamental because we do see so many athletes get to the end of a career and then they fall into a depressive state and struggle with drugs, alcohol, depression, and so on, because they lost how they identified themselves and trying to figure out where to turn, what to do, but a big central component of their identity is lost. So I knew that this was one way to express that and my grand goals have shifted they're shifted to other outlets that allow me to express that. Like my companies, Kabuki Strength, I'm going to change the face of fitness as well as all the way through with its integration with clinical medicine and telemedicine. And, you know, I got another five years before even people see what I'm working on. I'm five years in right now because I had to invent equipment. I have to develop methodologies that we're talking. I had to do this stuff that ground layer wasn't done to create a cohesive ecosystem mm -hmm. of training methodology tied to the tools that we're using today, to the environment tied to the clinical practice assessment tied to the, the interaction between all those and how that actually needs to be reframed because so much of this is broken, okay? So, <laughs> but there is sadness. I won't deny that. And the sadness comes in the singularity of focus that I had at that time, the being in the process. Not necessarily doing it, but like having, being in this place that the rest of the world kind of fell away from me in those final phases to have something so intense, to have a team around me so focused on supporting. And like, it took me a couple months after that squad. I finally, one day I woke up and I was like, oh, welcome back to the world. <laughs> like I was in such a mental fog. Like I was, it took me a while to climb out of that, but that, that space, that level of intensity intensity and drive and, and living and being in that space. I, I do miss that, but I also, I can't continue that. I couldn't continue. Like there's a point of like, you push it so hard. The level to try to go from there is not acceptable for what you, the impacts that'll have on your life or how you want to live. And it was taking away those final, like I, I had to do extreme things and live in an extreme way to, to, to get there you're just a genius in this whole space of strength and health and bi almost like biology that uh, this strength feat is just one representation of that. 
But this particular strength feat required that kind of singular focus, which I think, I don't know, there's something beautiful about that singular focus. There That's is. Often there is. only truly perfected in athletics. I see it with the greatest Olympic athletes as well. The kind of singular focus required there is incredible. It's somehow some of the most beautiful things that humans can do. Uh, and it's not in that just that thing. Focus. So that's the thing. It's like, oh, that must be it. When we say singularity of focus, it's not like, here's it, because it it covers a vast array of stuff. Like I was working with people, you know, all, well, yeah, I, all around North America. I wouldn't say anybody around the globe, but professionals coming in, working on different aspects of rehab and, and recovery. And like, I mean, I'm tapping all sorts of stuff in so many platforms from nutrition to drugs to, uh, again, like, you know, various uh, Chinese medicine, you know, as far as, you know. <laughs> but also like, the humans in like your life, so just love and, and uh, positivity and just inspiration, all those kinds of aspects. I mean, you probably would have done much more if you uh, went outside North America and talked to some Russians, just between you and I, some <laughs> Russians. Poss <stuff>. Possibly. <laughs> <laughs> they, they give you some, uh, I don't know, those, those, there's some incredible strength athletes in Eastern Europe. Uh, absolutely. Um, I've got uh, the best one uh, coming in September. Uh, to get fixed. So what do you mean by fixed? So I'm not sure what his particular issues are, but uh, he has held the all time world record repeatedly for a long time. And uh, he hasn't competed for some time. And he just reached out saying he would like to come and have me take a look and see if I can get him fixed because he so needs to in, return. It's, okay. So it's more injury centric versus like form and uh, fundamental centric a combination uh, the, the, of everything. <laughs> everybody <laughs> always wants to focus on the output. How do you, how do you give me the fix for that? But yeah, yeah. it ties right back into all those other things. <laughs> right. So, uh, but yeah, the Eastern, the Eastern block continued to be a dominant force uh, in regards to uh, athletics and strength athletics without a doubt. Some of my big rivals in my competitive days were, that's, that's who it was. <laughs> Rivalry brings out the best in us. Can you tell me the story of your childhood? It's definitely outside the scope of the norm. Well, today, maybe not 150 or 200 years ago, <laughs> but uh, my parents, highly intelligent, you know, people coming out of the Bay Area. My mom was, you know, going to school to be a chemical engineer. She was a top top student athlete graduated out of her school. My father was a member of Mensa. My stepfather was just a genius, but not able to really function in society. But my mom was, you know, she had some demons and some other stuff. And just, she just said one day, she's like, I just don't want to be part of society. She still isn't, <laughs> uh, lives out in the desert, but uh, has her minds. But she wanted to figure out a way to make a life outside of that. And so that's where we ended up, is up in the mountains in Northern California. And uh, a lot of that was, you know, them trying to get into successfully growing marijuana, which back in that, you know, wasn't legal back then, highly illegal. And in fact, those areas were, some of the areas where we lived were quite dangerous. So there's a documentary, um, Murder Mountain, that came out recently. If you watch that, you'll tie into my book, uh, just the understanding of w the stuff that I was talking about dealing with serial killers, human trafficking, police corruption, uh, murderers, like just how real that stuff is if it doesn't capture you from the book, okay? The book, by the way, is The Eagle and the Dragon. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a great I'm a one. terrible salesperson, yeah. like I told you. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> But a good, uh, it's a good title. I don't know if you came up with it, but- uh, I did. One. Yeah. So yeah, we'll talk about so, that anyway. We're living by a, a stream, you know, off a meadow. There's no roads into where you have to hike in. And we've got beams lashed into the trees up above us because that's where our bedding is because there's rattlesnake dens all around. And six years old, I'm being taught how to capture and handle live rattlesnakes because that's what I need to do to be safe. And you can imagine six years old sitting there with a live rattlesnake in your hand, grabbing it, you know, by the side of the head, controlling so it can't can't bite you. And it's just wrapping itself around your arm and you're staring at it. like its only intent is right then is to kill you. Mm -hmm. Like that's it, right? Um, you you want to take a bath, it's filling up the jug in the stream and setting it out on the rocks during the during the sun so you can dump it over your head. And you know, not all the living was that way, 
you know, good part was similar to that tent living, living in a 16 foot trailer with a family of six, which is not much bigger than the space that we're sitting here. Um, so, you know, we're talking hard winters with feet of snow on the ground, nowhere to go. Um, I'm living in the back of the, the pickup truck and, uh, just a standard sleeping bag that we get from the Salvation Army, not the, not the blow zero. So I'm, uh, I'm, I'm not sleeping well. There's living in homes that were maybe uh, condemned. There's no, no doors even on them, no electricity or running water or one or the other or both, and sometimes a little bit better. By the time we got to high school, uh, we had a mobile home. So my stepfather had won a disability payment because he had a broken arm that whole time uh, from an accident a long time ago. And finally got uh, an award and got a down payment on this mobile home that didn't have, again, doors on the inside. It did have running water. It did have electricity. It didn't have a kitchen. You know, the windows would you know, crank close and open, but they wouldn't close all the way. So the trim them in with uh, plastic to be able to uh, try to protect from the elements. That was my environment, like learning how to forage for mushrooms. I mean, there were summers I would send, and you know, my parents would be out. They were in the drug trade earlier. We got taken by the by the police and put into foster care for for a while, which ties into some of the stories with human trafficking. And honestly, I, it's in my book, but it's really hard for me to talk about that uh, stuff. Um, and obviously not all that's in the book. So, um, but they got us back and we moved to, to Oregon and they stayed out of the drug trade from that time to ensure that they didn't lose us again, but quickly we kind of fell back into the same thing. So at that point it was learning about geology and starting to do mining and firewood cutting, but mostly the mining because Pat's broken arm chainsaw made it a little tough. If you remember just the sequence of moments, do you, um, are you haunted by the, the darker moments of your childhood? Do you remember moments of simple joy and happiness? Outside of the living around dangerous people and the interactions that came from that, we were a family. Like we were a cohesive unit battling against the world together. We spent all our time together, work, play. I was there. I was helping raise my my siblings or I was working with them. And, you know, it was a constant, like I said, we were very physically active. So, you know, I had that in my upbringing. Um, I had a plug for my shoe company, Barefoot, mm -hmm. B-E-A-R. Mm -hmm. I ran around the wilderness and bare feet all the time, you know, but it, it was, I had a lot of great moments and I'm thankful for a lot of that childhood once we take out the trauma and the other stuff associated with it, right? And so the connection that I have with my sisters um, is, is, is huge. Um, that goes a bit further to, cause I am kind of like a, a little bit of a father figure because I was at home raising them. And then later I took custody of them uh, while I was going to school because the environment at home deteriorated further. Their step stepfather, like I said, was, he wasn't capable of managing life. And uh, my mom had a mental breakdown and took off to Montana and he descended into madness even worse. Uh, actually took my, my 13 year old sister and kicked her out in the middle of winter, a couple feet of snow on the ground because he thought she stole his favorite cereal bowl um type so yeah that's when i t took in and i uh, was going to college putting myself through college and i started taking custody of my sisters and raising them so anyway we're still like very very tight family um it took there was a few years later in life like that the connection with my mother was kind of broken um i didn't speak to her for years because of her basically abandoning my sisters and me having to come in, but that, that we've worked through that as best we can. So you anger on your part? It wasn't, there might've been some anger. Um, Did you always love her? Yes, and I still do. And I'm so, she's taught me basically everything I know about strength and perseverance and living life on your terms and being able to, to create that. And so much of what I am is from that right? We've all had to learn to be okay with the way she is because she is just blunt, but you know, she's the one that figured out that the human trafficking situation and got, uh, got the DA involved and got all the, she's the one that 
I've learned a lot from her. And uh, <laughs> did you inherit some of the demons? Oh, most certainly. And I, it's something I've continued. Like, uh, in my father's side, has has been really tough on that because some of it is just based genetic as well. So my my stepfather made I think six or seven attempts on his life during his lifetime. Uh, one of those in front of me. Uh, his mother blew her head off with a shotgun. Uh, her brother jumped out a window in L.A. Uh, their father did something similar, and I don't know how far back it goes because there is no family except for me and my my children. You spoke about going through depression yourself. Yeah. Can you um, talk about some of the darker moments of that? Have you ever, like many in your family, have you ever considered suicide? Yes, I have. Yes, I have. You've achieved a lot of exceptional things in your life. Can you talk about those early days of depression and how you overcame it? Yeah. So the things that I did that people give me accolades for are the things that I did selfishly to save myself. The things like taking custody of my sisters, being the person that everybody around you know the the important people relied on the fact that i had to step to the plate and be present and be that person because if i failed they failed they would be like the people that i grew up with that are dead or in prison or on drugs and they're either way to to one of those right that's where everybody ended and I wasn't gonna let that happen. What about saving yourself? And, and so that's how, in those early days, that's how I did it. I'm not saying it's the best approach, but it was survivor mentality. It was, I can't selfishly do that because I have them to take care of, hmm. right? And then that continued where I would keep putting myself in these leadership roles or other things and just always being this person that was at the center, at the hub that forced me to be there and so it's only in the more recent you know last decade or so that i have had to really learn how to come and start confronting some of those demons and you think man why is the guy so successful like i mean and we haven't talked about all the stuff that i've done but like um i've seen a lot of success in both uh, business leadership athletics uh <laughs> academics <laughs> uh entrepreneurship, all these sorts of things, right? But if it wasn't for, you know, having kids and the same being in the position, I wouldn't be here. If it, and that's just, that's the reality of it. And I'm learning to, to come and manage those as best I can, learning to meditate into those things and really feel what the driver is so I can get to those, those root understanding. Um, and, and having some guidance doing so. Like, if you've got mental health issues, this isn't something that you need to tackle on your own. Like having a professional that can help guide you on that introspective journey is, is something like, it's not like, hey, I'm big tough guy, I can handle everything, <laughs> you know? That's fascinating that um, you saved yourself. That's quite powerful to save yourself by uh, having others depend on you. And so you can't fail, you can't fuck it up. And that's a reason to keep moving forward. But uh, on the flip side, that's not addressing the darkness. It's not, and it probably not a sustainable strategy <laughs> either, right? So I, I well, recognize these things. I don't know. And uh, yeah, it, perhaps it is sustainable. Perhaps that's, I mean, there, there's something beautiful about giving yourself basically in service of others and thereby creating purpose. And then like, it's almost like that, fake that it, it till you make it. <laughs> and well, then you make it eventually. Yeah. That is purpose though. That like, is purpose. That is purpose. I mean, you have to, to me, life is about taking your cup and how you choose to pour it out, how you choose to give. What is your purpose? What is that connection with everybody around you? This is that's that's the intent that's the life that's that's what life is about how are you going to help those around you how are you going to help the world you know your purpose is is right here figuring out what this is and then how to do that but at the same time 
you can't let that run dry. So you have to make sure right. that you're filling That's that the other cup. side. That's the other side, right? <laughs> That's the uh, other side. Yeah. We'll return to your engineering degree, which you're obviously scientifically engineering minded, which is fascinating. Your book is titled The Eagle and the Dragon. Uh, what do the eagle and the dragon symbolize? They're pretty big symbols for me. In fact, that covers my entire body as a tattoo. So the first one I had done is around 19 years old. And so this is, or started at 19. Uh, it's an, uh, an eagle that covers my entire front, you know, my stomach, rib cage, and, and one that was on my back that covered most of my back. And there's chained at the, well, at the claw, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, and the chain wraps down around and attaches to, to my ankle and there's a shackle there. And so this was something that I had done at that age because it was, to me, it was a representation of your potential, your strengths, your abilities, that you can fly to whatever height that you want in this world. The only thing holding you back at the end of the day is yourself. And this was I hadn't necessarily accomplished a whole lot at that time. I mean, I was valedictorian for high school, small high school. Uh, <laughs> does that even count? Uh, uh, I was a state level wrestler. This was my belief. And, and you, you sensed that there was a potential in you and the only thing that could uh, stop you from realizing that potential was yourself. That's right. That's a heck of a tattoo to get, by the way, at 19, but that, yeah, yeah. <laughs> about 40 hours went into that thing. It shows you got some guts. And then the next tattoo, so <laughs> I only have two. Uh, I had done in 2015, 2016, uh, when I, so at this point in my life, so I had done that. I had flown to whatever heights, right? So I had, I had proven to myself and, and maybe done what I thought I needed to do to show the world that this poor kid from the sticks, this, this kid growing up in the mountains with nothing could achieve the American dream. I was a corporate executive sought after that I'd come in, I'd fix companies, I'd turn around and prep them for sale. I'd take a company and grow it from a, a regional to a national to a global presence. I did this in the automotive manufacturing, aerospace manufacturing, high tech, heavy industry. Uh, and uh, I had a house with a white picket fence. I was a successful athlete with all-time world records. I owned a gym on the side where I coached people and uh, I had a comfortable marriage that everything was hunky-dory with no arguments at home. <laughs> and uh, I walked away from all of it. I left everything behind, except for my kids. I wanted to chase what I was meant to do and chase what I was capable of doing. I wanted to become a better version of myself, but very intentfully. And that's what I did. I sold, I had multiple homes, sold my homes. <laughs> I cashed in all my retirement that I'd earned for 20, nearly 20 years. And I lost all that. I leveraged myself millions of dollars of personal debt so that if I failed, there was no way out. Even going back to that old career that I did well, I'd be living in an apartment the rest of my life paying it off. People would question, people questioned me at the time because I had a comfortable, easy marriage. And I chose to ask for a divorce. And I ended up living in an apartment for a couple years with no income selling off every last thing that I had, except for my two vehicles that I built and uh, with, my, with my kids. And hmm. I started my businesses to help people live a better quality of life, to get them out of pain, to help them live better through strength, to realize that stress, demand, those things, they don't have to be the thing that, if you look back, made you had the bad back, made you have the bad Ds, but they do the opposite. They get you out of pain. And then I started work on my book to, to, to hit on those other things, the mental, the emotional, maybe even spiritual. I don't touch on that one too much in there, but it's all the same. Um, that things that happen around you to you, like maybe they're bad. I can't take away that, 
but why can't you use what you have of it to become a stronger and better person, to become more resilient, to be able to take the, the things that you don't know that are coming in the future? And so this is very intentful. And that's what the second, I'm long-winded to answer in your question here. The dragon. The dragon. The dragon you... is an Ouroboros. <laughs> and so yeah. it is, it circles my entire upper body, my shoulders, my back, my chest, everything. It's right here, there's this big dragon head and its tail is right there in its mouth that's eating itself. And it may sound a bit graphic or whatever, but it is, it's the eating of the old becoming the new. It is the purposeful reinvention of oneself. It is the deciding not realizing just your potential, but deciding specifically who you want to be in this fucking world and becoming that person. Can you comment on the, the value and the power of putting a flame to, you know, <laughs> uh, your old life, your old self, just destroying all of it as you walk into the new life, you know? Did you have to do that? <laughs> I don't recommend this, by the way, because when you put yourself in no way out, there yeah. is no way out. Yeah. Okay. Like you got to really, <laughs> no. but I, I can be an overconfident individual at times. Yeah. And uh, I live, I live through extremes. I think it's a great way of actually finding your real values and how you want to live, honestly, to chase having absolutely perfect squat technique, but Chase putting every freaking thing that you got in it, which most people would say, those are, those are opposite. Those are diametrically opposed. Um, I wanted a better home life. I wanted to do more in the world through my work. And the burning the bridges mentality is not necessarily, you know, the, the best. There was some temperament in that though, because I, I was not, I was slow to make the shift for a long time because I'd been thinking about doing it, but I was thinking about doing it in a healthcare perspective. I'm going to go back to school to be a surgeon or a physical therapist or a chiro because that's where like all my research and stuff was in this, this human movement and rehab and recovery. This is the mentors that I've been developing were the best in the world in these things, in these disciplines. Those were my, my friends and, and, uh, but I wasn't able to compromise my family's certain quality of life I wanted to to keep this. It was it was slow and hard for me to make that transition, but I didn't do it until I had a platform built enough that those first few years I did have an income. I was able to make enough from the business until it grew so fast that I needed so much more needed to come in. The living in the apartment piece and doing all that that was actually a couple years into uh into that process, maybe like 2 years. Mm -hmm. Um, well, I'm with you on that. So I, I'm actually going through that very process now. I put, uh, it, it, I put everything, I quit everything, gave away everything and starting anew. And uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, this podcast somehow became quite um, popular. So it's getting in, in the way of my burning everything to the ground. <laughs> <laughs> but in that, it's a source of joy. But the main thing I'm after is uh, the similar project as you is building a business sense of joy so this this is the point i want to drive home right now right now because when i say burn i learned that burning the bridges works because that's how i had to succeed when i was earlier the bridges weren't burnt they didn't exist there was no couch to go home to there was no there was no fallback plan and it forced me and gave me the confidence to know that i can pull it off but i don't encourage people because there's so much out there of this hustle porn and other stuff going, just grind, just go after it, get in and start your, like, you'll get there. And it's all about the output to make money, to be somebody, to do this. And I'll tell you what, that is some short-term motivation right there. I feel like dropping a few swear words, but um, <laughs> you're this, always welcome. <laughs> this, this is, we've already done a few, so we'll, uh, we'll, all right, we'll bounce uh, it out. Um, <laughs> That is short term. That is not going to keep you going. This need, if you're going to go that approach, it needs to be because this is your North Star. There's going to be so much hard work. There's going to be years of just pushing through where your question, not only is everybody around you questioning you and your family's questioning you, you're questioning yourself going, man, I don't know if I can pull this off. You're going to be stressed. You're going to be pulled to the max. If somebody comes up to me and says, should I start a business? I'm going to say no. 
And they'll be like, oh, you're supposed to motivate me. If you need me to motivate you, this is the wrong damn approach for you. This is going to be hard. Mm -hmm. This is going to be harder than you expect, even with me telling you this. And so it better damn well be worth it. This better be your North fucking star. This better live and be a way for you to be able to articulate or realize those values that you want to live. This isn't something to make money. This is a way for you to live the life and be able to share the values that you have with the world. Mm -hmm. And that's what it is. And if you don't have that, which is going to give you joy, <laughs> then freaking walk away. Yeah. This is not some way to make some money and be known. I mean, this, this includes both like simple day-to-day -day joy and also deep meaning. Exactly. Uh, the whole thing. And then that allows you to overcome all the all the pain along the way. But I got to say, I mean, it's a difficult thing because you run a business. I'm, this podcast and a lot of things I do research-wise is full of joy, but it's simple. Running a business is hard. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it's something that I'm very hesitant about in that so to almost push back a little bit, I think if I do get the guts to start the business, it will not be because I'm not choosing a more joyful life because I'm already truly happy. The reason I'll choose it is because I just can't help it. There's this, I've always had this dream and I know it's gonna lead to suffering and I know it's gonna be a life that has less happiness in it, as sad as this to say. But it won't be it won't be less happiness. Because we talk about this cup and where you choose to pour it and what yeah. you choose to do with it. And when you look back on things, the things yeah. that are gonna give you the most joy, yeah. the most proud, the things that are gonna stand out in your life that you really remember are gonna be those days. Yeah. And you're, those years you struggle, you're gonna look back on 10 years later and go, fuck. Those were the glory days. <laughs> Those were the glory days. Yeah. And it won't feel like it at the time. Yeah. It's so but weird. That's what life's made of. Yeah. And so this is your <laughs> this is your opportunity. You feel that. So right now you got this when you think about it, you got this little thing twisting up in your gut, right? Yeah. It's like it's a mixture of anxiety and fear as well as excitement. Mm -hmm. And that is that's your signal that this is your opportunity for that personal growth to challenge yourself. This is your going for a run or working out in the heat. It's it's those things. It is your opportunity to go, heck, maybe it even fails. Mm -hmm. Maybe it even fails. But by turning into that, you're going to learn so much and it's going to make you so much better. And it's the path that you should take when you have this stuff rolling around in there. Mm -hmm. And I don't, it could just be, a hard conversation with your partner or your boss. Mm -hmm. It could be taking on a project mm -hmm. that, you know, the, you know, that your boss is thrown out to the team and you're like, oh, I'm gonna hide in the back. I don't want that one. And it's like, maybe, maybe you do. Maybe it's going back to school. Yeah. Maybe it's making that career move that you always wanted, but you're just, a, you're just afraid of. Mm -hmm. All these things are your opportunity for you to turn into that, it is your workout. It is your practice. Because if you don't, you'll get soft. And who knows what's coming and you're not going to be ready for it. Mm -hmm. And it's going to run right over the top of you because you're going to be weak. You're going to be soft. There's some aspect in which choosing that hard path is actually the the way to arrive at the richest kind of happiness, the, 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 the greatest fulfillment. That's the funny thing about just the human. But just make sure you're filling the cup as you're going through it, not pouring <laughs> it all out. So that's the, yeah, that's sure. the part to figure out, right? Sure. Well, life is short anyway. Um, eventually, eventually the cup will be empty. Um, so maybe time the refilling of the cup correctly, so you maximize the little time you got. Let me talk to you about strength a little bit first high level, what are the differences in the different disciplines of strength? So powerlifting we talked about, maybe just to clarify for people, powerlifting, Olympic lifting, um, just regular gym fitness, bodybuilding, doing curls in front of the mirror for hours like I do. 
What's what's the difference between all of these? Oh, and also strongman. Every one of those, as far as the athletic uh, disciplines, are different qualities. So we want to think about things as terms of quality. So there's strength, there's power, um, there's endurance, there's the, the ability to um, be coordinated and athletic. There's all these things, and they're different. They're different qualities. So your training, as it relates to that, is how you cycle in the development of those qualities. What we want to think about is there, there's a lot of different frames of thought, some very uh, classical, maybe not classical Russian approach because there's a lot of different approach from the Eastern uh, Bloc, but uh, one of the ones is developing all the qualities at once, You know, focusing on building those. Uh, more of a periodization effect would be focusing on one quality at a time or one quality while maintaining other qualities and then shifting that around. So it's just going to be a little different based on what the output is and what the desired. So like powerlifting is actually, power is the wrong word. There's actually no power in it. It's just brute. It's it's strength. Mm -hmm. um, application of force. Um, so Olympic power, lifting would actually be a better name for power. powerlifting <laughs> um, because that is more explosive uh, development. There's um, strongman is again, now we're getting a little bit more athletic. It's equipment uh, based on the implements and stuff that are used, how fast you can move your feet and run, mixed with more endurance, but still very strength focused. Mm -hmm. And there's some things with strongman that is straight, like each one of these is very also focused on different genetic dispositions. Mm -hmm. So actually, if you look at the history of sports, you'll find that they're a lot of times based on different populations. And that sounds like it's very un-PC, but like, uh, Highland Games. Um, they've got deep, deeper hip sockets that are shallow. So you're going to see a lot of short hip hinge movements like the the caber toss and mm -hmm. things like that. Muay Thai wrestling. They've got a completely different hip joint. Mm -hmm. And so strongman itself is going to be for very large frame individuals. If you're not well over six foot and a large person, you're probably not going to perform well. Very few people at sub six foot have ever done well at strongman just because it's, it's leverage based, right? Um, Olympic lifting. We see consistently in, in Europe, uh, the, the history tells us a high level of hip uh, and back issues because of the depth that that hip socket has to go in to be able to complete that lift. Mm -hmm. And so you're going to see issues with populations that don't have the ability to do that. So, so we've talked a little bit about training as well as disposition. Yeah. So, and also CrossFit fits into that. That's more yep. like strongman, but for a, a wider variety of bodies, I suppose. Yep. And definitely more metabolic conditioning focused than the than the strength aspect of it. Um, and, and and conditioning is an interesting thing too. So that quality, in my opinion, can be developed a, a lot faster, but kind of peaks much faster as well. So mm -hmm. you, where strength, we can continue to add and add and add over time. Uh, so. It's for me, like for conditioning with any strength athlete, I don't like to spend as much time on that. So I'll cycle uh, the conditioning work for our strength athletes and then taper that off leading into meat. So the more uh, metabolic work, that means the more capacity in strength training that you can accomplish, which is the goal, mm -hmm. um, and recover from. But then as we lead to a competition, we want to spend more time on recovering from that. So we have to pull things out. So we'd pull out less. So like a uh, typical approach would be like taking a six week cycle for conditioning and ramping, ramping up over three weeks periods time, then dropping back down again and ramping up and being slightly offset by like a week or two from your strength peaks mm -hmm. so that you've actually tapered the week prior in your conditioning work to your strength work, right? And, but that way we're not hitting conditioning hard all the time, which is a common, common uh, misstep that people make is going, well, I need conditioning. So they just hammer that at a base level over the top mm -hmm. instead of cycling that. If we talk about powerlifting, in terms of regimen, in terms of exercise, yeah. in terms of the process that would consistent with what, is there something to be said about general qualities of the consistency of the regimen required to get strong? Yes. So let's talk about some training principles as a whole. And this will, I think this will break the, down what you're, what you're wanting. <laughs> the more work that we can fit into a given time, the more progress we're going to make. But that doesn't mean doing the max amount of work 
possible at any given time. So we know that we're always, to, to, to accomplish more, we're always going to have more. And there's a certain ceiling that you're going to hit that you're not going to be able to add more. So you want to start and get the most amount of results that you can with the least amount of work because you're going to have to do it again like this stair step over and over, year, decade, so on. So when people, this is a big miss people got, they look at uh, a Chico program from Russia or so on, and they go, I'm going to follow this. And it's like, that was specifically written for somebody with 20 years of experience that's already built the capacities to be at that level. So it's all about building that work capacity. So how much work can you give in a given time? So now we want to look at some research as it relates to injuries, because injuries are going to be a big driver over time of what holds you back. So when we talk consistency, training hard for three years, five years, it's going to be really good. But what we find is a lot of people train really hard for nine months, have to slow back for a month, get back into it, then miss another week because, and so on. They're always like this little nagging, that little nagging. And so it's pretty clear in the research we want to, we're looking at when we're stair stepping this stuff, we're looking at acute and chronic loading. So, some fancy words for average and like what's happening right now. So, this given week would be our acute, chronic would be what is our average loading, let's say, over the last six months. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, the more that we can move the chronic loading up, the more work we're getting done on a, as a whole over time, we're going to get stronger. The way that we build the capacity to do that is having spikes in acute loading, mm -hmm. okay? Now, the, the, as we do this, the, the acute loading, if it spikes more than 10, maybe 15% from what the chronic loading has been, that accounts for 80% of injuries out there. Wow. So it's not actually the movement quality or this misstep or the other. It usually happens about four, five, six weeks later. It's like, oh, this nagging, and then it gets worse, and then now you gotta, you gotta do some rehab. Your training sessions aren't as good, and so on. So now we're starting to look at this. Okay, it's like I want to do the, I want to do the least amount of work where I can still progress. I want to be able to have spikes in my weekly demand that don't go above 10 to 15% of what I've been averaging for the last month. But every time I do a spike, my, my average goes up, right? Boom, boom, mm -hmm. boom. And then that becomes very particular also when you take, when you do take plan time, time off. So a lot of people, uh, training session, maybe they're doing a five week block with a, 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 a deload week, or you go on vacation for a week or any of those things that were a downward what does that do to your average and chronic loading? It brings it down. And then what does the person want to do when they come back? Make up for it. Mm -hmm. Now they have a huge spike above. Five weeks later, we're dealing with, oh, this elbow, this wrist, whatever's kind of bothering me. And now you're not performing as much. So these are some really fundamental pieces of, 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 of training. And then now we can start overlaying the qualities that we're trying to develop mm -hmm. that we were talked about earlier. So now it's, let's talk about my deadlift, my thousand pound deadlift. We'll talk about the training cycles for both the thousand uh, deadlift and squat. So backing up a year out from the deadlift, knowing I was training at the time, heavy deadlifts once a week. And usually it was two of those sessions a month were really heavy and the others weren't. And it's like, okay, how can we get this up to where I'm deadlifting twice a week? Because that's where I want to be. <laughs> Uh, to be able to accomplish this, I need to be loading about that much with frequency with a certain volume to be able to accomplish this goal. We're not going to go through all the math and stuff like that and how that's arrived. But, but there is math. There is math behind this. And so instead of just like, oh, well, let's start deadlifting twice a week. No. So we start and we take the one session that we've got and we split it, part of it, take part of it away and put it in the second half of the week. So the total volume is still the same. Mm -hmm. And then... Um, we start adding some volume, but I'm doing it at a off of block so that the actual load is, accumulative load is less because I have less range of motion, okay? And then we start building that closer to the ground, closer to the ground, and so on. And now we start getting to where I'm almost doing two sessions, full sessions a week. And then we start adding a little bit of load. And so at my level, this isn't talking about adding another set or another day a week. We're talking, like in my squat, it might be one rep. Instead of doing three sets of three at uh, one week, I do 
two doubles or two triples, then two doubles to give me one more rep. That's it. And so we're doing that from one week to the next. And that's a cycle, training cycle. It might be five, six weeks and then so on. And then the next one and slowly bringing that average load up. Mm -hmm. So the last phases of the squat, for example, we took the average loading every week. So my, of my heavy sets. So once we developed all this stuff over the last year to get to this point, now it is taking and going, okay, my average load this week is eight reps at 955 pounds. And then the next week, let's get it to nine, 957, mm -hmm. 963. And this was pretty aggressive working up to where my average loading, the final that at the final was 985 pounds. Mm -hmm average load for eight to nine reps. And that's what I said, this is the intense part. That was why it was the day of was much easier. Mm -hmm. That week over week is pretty brutal. Um, may not sound, oh, you're just squatting. And now let's back it up. Let's look at the quality development. So a year out from the squat, um, obviously I've been working on developing axial load capacity, my capacity to withstand load from top to bottom. So I like thinking about things in movement vectors. So this vector is an axial loaded vector is the hardest to recover from. Um, Sorry, what's axial? So like is deadlift, yeah, or are they both? They're both, yep. So a horizontal, a front to back would be like a row or a press. Why right? is the axial uh, hardest to recover from? Because it's the entire body, the entire- Entire body, recall? just anything that is that, uh, that uh, taxes the, the, the spinal mechanics. I, I don't, I could tell you my beliefs. It's studied, it yeah. is. Okay. Um, we can just keep the discussion on that, but short like that. So, <laughs> yeah, uh, so we start looking at those different vectors that we're training in. So this is why this is important to understand. So I'm not just getting into nuance here. So, Hey, squatting is going to make me, make me jump further. Cause it's legs. Well, squatting is an axial load vector and jumping is a vector this way. So actually hip thrust would help with your inhale. Your, and this is proven in science, with your forward jumping ability. Uh, they're both working similar muscles, the glute extension, but they're working it in those different platforms. So it's really important to understand because people don't understand, I'm building my work capacity by doing sled pushes. Mm -hmm. You're not developing your work capacity for squatting. Most movements, even ones as holistic as a, as a squat, require specialization. Yep. You can't get strong at the squat by doing- it, uh, You're gonna have some carryover, right? Obviously, but because you, taking an untrained person that hasn't done it is still not, still not gonna do as good as somebody that's done non-specific work, but mm -hmm. done work. So, but yes, for the most part. To get truly strong, you need yeah. to specialize. So, but not all the time. So now we talk about quality. So, and if we specialize in the same thing too long, we stagnate because the body adapts to a certain point and just can't make progress. So we wanted to save the actual squatting in the pattern with the bar that I was doing for the very end. So starting a year out, I started doing work front squatting, like a squat axial loaded pattern and worked on maximizing that up. Then I started shifting to doing transformer bar squat. It's this bar I developed that actually change manipulates spinal mechanics. So I started loading in these more forward positions and being able again. So now I'm getting closer than a front squat, but not quite squatting. And then I would start adjusting that bar every training cycle to closer to a squat, closer to a squat till it finally was right. So what's the difference between a front squat and a regular, like a back squat, like in terms of the, the stress on the body, the mechanics, yeah. was there something interesting to be said about like how fundamentally different are they? So it's interesting, people think about the weight in, in position to them, like, oh, the bar's in front of me, the bar's behind me, which is not the case. Um, the bar is above your midfoot. The load is above your midfoot. Mm -hmm. So we're actually manipulating the spine behind the bar. <laughs> so we're causing spinal uprighting behind the bar, getting in a more erect position, which is gonna change the relationship of the hip angle. It's gonna change our ability to maintain the spine. It's going to change the uh, how much the, the core comes in, how hard it is to maintain that sternum to diaphragm relationship that we talked about. All this stuff starts changing. So the bar stays in the same place. The bar is still behind you, but the load yeah. moves around. So, but we're actually manipulating the spine around the load. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's incredible. We can tailor it to an athlete, mm -hmm. which is great when you got a seven foot plus tall ba baseball player or a basketball player, 
That's why we work with all these teams. Anyway, so it's like you're taking something and getting closer and closer to it. At the same time, we're looking at the quality. So like I needed to be able to really hold this torso position with the weight moving up here. Now, unlike the deadlift, the ability to manage this TL position becomes much more challenging. So that was also why I was choosing the transformer bar because it actually challenges that more in those big forward positions. I was also working on my back strength tremendously to be able to hold a maintained position. So there was a lot of like, I chose a bent over rows. So a bent over row is a mixed vector. So it's a forward to back. So it wouldn't have as much carrier, but it's also um, uh, got some axial loading component in it as well. Mm -hmm. um, so we're working on that. And then as, it, as we get closer and closer to competition, I'm developing those strengths, but now I need to start tapering those out. So all of my recovery needs can now go into the more specific that I'm actually ramping the load up. So as I'm ramping the load on the weight, I'm able to ramp it a lot faster because I'm tapering out the other stuff so I can still keep my total mm -hmm. load high, but now get it very, very specific. Wow. So everything that I've done has always been kind of an annual training cycle. Mm -hmm. um, and then again, this was like a, this was a five-year training cycle, but we just kind of walked through the last year of each and you can see how these concepts play out in reality. So in the cycling, so this is both for you, but also for more recreational strength athletes, let's say there's variety injected into the system. You need variety. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because you will st basically stagnate at some level, right? So you should, should always be kind of shifting a little bit. So um, three to four month blocks in general for an average, you know, just a gen pop fitness is pretty good um, where you're going to spend more time maybe in a higher rep range or lower rep range, a little bit more uh, work on uh, endurance capacity or maybe some more time. Hey, I'm playing around with boxing or jujitsu or something like that. Bring that a little bit more to the front forefront for a while and bring the other out. But like mixing, mixing those variables up, but trying to keep the total load the same and always kind of like, yeah, or do we add a little more? Again, it doesn't have to be major and it shouldn't be major. You don't want these big jumps. You don't go, oh my God, let's move. Uh, let's jump into squatting every day. Um, you've got to build the capacity to do that. Mm -hmm. It's simple. What role would you say strength has in uh, sports that combine skill and strength? Yeah. So for me personally, maybe I'll just ask it selfishly, which is uh, uh, grappling, wrestling, MMA. Yeah. How about I start with baseball? <laughs> Please, uh, no. I, I, I would. No, okay, I know. The, the sport. Okay, uh, like no. baseball and golf are the two of my favorite sports. Uh, no, so, I don't. You don't have to be in shape at all to excel at those sports. Well, I, here's the thing. There so we go. It does <laughs> We're gonna help. get this argument. <laughs> well, I've got a perfect example because this is this is why I sell so many transformer bars into the the major league baseball. So they get these people uh, that come in, these athletes that have been baseball their whole life. It is part of the culture. And so they're great athletes. They've got all this skill. The only thing they have to do is develop a little bit more resilience mm. so that they don't have the injury. They, they can push their training a little bit more, that yeah. they can add a little bit more force output and be able to recover from it. So the only thing they've got to do is add some training, but there's no training culture there. So they don't have any experience, which is why they love the transformer bar because they don't have to worry about teaching the technique. We can actually set the bar on a setting that makes their squats perfect mm -hmm. by cueing all the stuff with actually not having to coach it. Because when you're coaching a room full of athletes, it's really hard to teach the nuance of all this and not sure that all that, but that's all that they have to do with these players with a huge level of skill. So once you reach a certain level of skill, adding strength is the, the only real forward path. Mm -hmm. So, so that's the, the, the basic simple answer to that. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the benefits there being like injury prevention, actually. Injury prevent resilience. resilience. Because we, especially uh, fighting sports, you're going to be challenged and, and thrown and other things happen to you. And the more resilient you can make your structures, the better you're gonna be. Even a cyclist, mountain biking, why would they need it? Why would they need to do upper body training? Take a crash, your shoulder's gone. You're done, your career's over. Unless you've done a little training. Right. So, so there's value in all this stuff, but, uh, the resilience is like, that's, that's huge. And then we can overlay strength. The people where we miss is this focus on strength when we haven't developed quality motor patterns first. So this is a huge thing with, uh, uh, children because people want to know what's the appropriate training age. 
Mm -hmm. I'd had my daughter training before my son because she developed movement patterns at a better quality earlier. There's no age because it's going to be very dependent on the individual. There's no point in having adaptation if we don't have the right thing to adapt to yet. And that applies to general movement, but also to sport. So, so yeah. you're saying the skills should be developed first and then the strength applied on top of that. Yep. Maybe you can educate me, but I actually quit lifting and powerlifting for a long time after I started um, judo, jiu-jitsu, grappling, all this sort of combat sports, because I found that it was preventing me from relaxing my body enough to um, load in the skill. So this isn't a problem with the uh, training. This is a problem with you. Yeah. So this is, this is actually here. really, really important. The first product I ever released was a loadable mace, a swinging mace. Mm -hmm. And because every power lifter and body, well, not every, but most serious power lifters and bodybuilders, like shoulders, mobility is pretty limited. Mm -hmm. And most of them really, really struggle with this. The problem is they've been taught to have tension all the time. And that's not good. So when we talk about like the joint positions that we were talking about earlier and having those and the muscles in the right length and tension relationship, um, athleticism is the speed to relaxation mm -hmm. wow. because the counter is speed to, to speed to contraction. Float like a butterfly, sting like a bee, right? And so what a mace can do is use that because this is a ties back into a, a developmental kinesiology because a lot of like reset patterns are getting back into these basic movements, but it's as much about relaxation as it is contraction, okay? So a mace, we have this weight on a big long lever. So I, if I grab a kettlebell and it'll be like, that's the same movement as a kettlebell halo. It is the same movement as a kettlebell. But here in the halo, I'm on the whole time. Mm -hmm. With the mace at the proper length, with the right distribution, you cannot do the movement. You could not move force your way through it. The only way that you can accomplish that is by relaxing. And then now we, now we can contract all the muscles related around that shoulder girdle. All at once, we're working on, off, on, off, on, off with moving and contracting. And now, so what happens a lot of times as we, you know, this stiffness and tightness happens, if we're in poor positions, we start using stabilizer muscles to do the movement. Mm -hmm. And then that's where this stiffness come from. So it means that in some of whatever training that you're doing, there's a deficit in the movement quality. Mm -hmm. Okay. Or there's a deficit in the training program and you're not recovering from. And 80% of the time, that's the right answer, right? But yeah, that's where the, where the gap is and learning how to relax. And the way a lot of the exercises are taught and have been taught for a long time, which is why there's a big gap. And this is why both clinical rehab and all these other components are mixed in my philosophy and what I'm trying to do with Kabuki strength, because I'm looking at holistic movement. I'm not looking at powerlifting. Base movements are what I want to load and be able to assess on. Mm -hmm. But this affects all sports, all activities, and strength doesn't have to be that. I mean, I, I'm, I'm freaking a thousand pound squatter and deadlifter. If you, if you watch any of my videos where I do like complete quad fallbacks, I don't what? stretch at all. I can usually get close to a full split, like if I want to. Um, what? <laughs> no, I did I, not it, see those videos. Okay. That's, uh, it's hard to believe. Wow. Okay. <laughs> that's, that's I, well, awesome. actually I do. I just did one recently, a quad fallback with my, with my mace loaded way out to the end, torsioning on wow. both ends of the other. And like, I do a lot of, I do a lot of wow. weird stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, that's awesome. Okay. Squatting doesn't make your hips tight. Mm -hmm. Squatting like shit makes your hips tight <laughs> and so <laughs> <laughs> but there is no perfect world we're always our training program isn't quite perfect our movement isn't necessarily perfect like so you're going to have the needs for this stuff but if you're always have to do some soft tissue work to loosen up the same one for that exercise to be able to get a joint in position there is a problem and i'm not saying don't do it do it because i don't want you to have a joint like if i can't get my shoulders in a position i can't do overhead presses because I'm gonna compromise my spine position. Then I'm gonna end up with some other problems, right? So go ahead and clean that up so you can get in position, but go figure out why it is and fix it. Mm -hmm. And then maybe next, you know, three, four months from now, they're gonna get a little something else going on. Fix it, 
but understand the deeper root reason of why. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I, I believe I am the only company manufacturing and selling you know, fascial soft tissue tools. And I'll tell you, I don't want you to use them. Because mm -hmm. it's not helping you get to the why, why it was caused in the first place. Yeah. The goal, the goal, the perfect state is not having to use them. Hmm. Reality is you're going to have to use them from time to time because the world's not perfect. Yeah. So your discovery is 100% on point. Yeah. Well, there's another side to combat sports. When you're beginning a particular combat sport, strength can be a negative because human psychology, because you can get away with a lot when you're stronger. Uh -huh. Yes, you can. So... so if your mind is strong enough to where you can just turn off that advantage and be a beginner truly in a, in a particular art, that's probably the best way to do it. But you can get away and you, then you don't learn. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's hard. Uh, it's hard not to use the little advantages you have because like jujitsu is a big hit on an, on the ego for, you know, especially guys, you know, when like a smaller person just destroys you, dominates you when you can, uh, I don't know, deadlift whatever number of pounds. And uh, it's hard not to use that strength to then resist the, <laughs> slow the ultimate destruction by like 120 pound. But, but that, and that's why I recommend developing the skill quality first, but it doesn't, it doesn't mean that you can't. You like, can't, that's you, right. can, you can still do it. So that don't take it as a like, oh, I can't go that direction. That's fine but understand those things. And then also understand the jujitsu is additional load on the body. Yeah. So you have to, you can't just add it on top. Yeah. You've got to taper back the other, you're gonna have to make a, I'm sorry, you may not want to hear it, but you're not gonna be able to do as much and add that here. Yeah. It's a compromise because your total volume <laughs> still has to be there. And there's not, unfortunately, not really a way to measure yeah. what the jujitsu volume is with this. So you've got to, take a look at that. And that's where like measuring like heart rate variability or other stuff mm -hmm. uh, can be useful. So you can see what is happening from me from a, a sympathetic versus parasympathetic nerve nervous system standpoint. Yeah. Making sure your body recovers efficiently and, and trying to put numbers to it. Yeah. You mentioned Kabuki strength. You run the Kabuki strength lab previously called the elite performance center in Oregon. You called it the perfect gym. <laughs> what makes uh, for the perfect strength? training I gym where i called it the perfect in a video gym. somewhere i watched oh man i mean that's where my testing grounds for developing all this stuff was through the years and and so this is like i said i started developing relationships with the best developmental kinesiologist in the in the u.s the best arguably the best or most well-known physical therapist in the world the best um spine biomechanist in the world I started doing continuing education with these clinical courses and learning this stuff and going, mm -hmm. but how does it work in my world, right? And then I started lecturing with them and all this other stuff, but the lab was like, where do we test this stuff, right? And so let me get to a point. There's three things. It's always three things. <laughs> so um, to be a success, to achieve success, I believe there's three things that really, really come into place. And it's the right methodology the right tools and the right environment. And so it was all about building that. And so the methodologies came from a lot of that different, that gray area interaction of clinical with sports science, right? And then the tools I had to start creating and designing. And then the environment is having this, you know, focused environment of people that want to do better and push each other and having community and culture, right? I end up building these connections, this network. Everything that I'm doing with my businesses is trying to create that into a scalable fashion. And so I'm building the groundwork because to have a system that like, yeah, I had clinicals on site that knew exactly what we were doing. And when it's me and a few people in a small team and all this stuff, we're all just like easy to manage. And you can see these, there's other models around this. So I've been other areas since maybe whenever it was, I filmed that video that said that, <laughs> that they have that same same model and it's taken probably about a decade usually to develop that mm -hmm. you know and having the right people in this community they can create this this network and the tool and all this stuff right except they still don't have the best tools because kabuki strength didn't exist um <laughs> but uh, but 
and so out of that was is essentially I started building this business and people like when did you know how all this stuff was connected and i'm like i don't know i didn't i just started creating mm -hmm. on the outset the things that worked until finally i'm like oh i'm recreating a scalable version of this stuff mm -hmm. here's the methodologies and a coaching platform that we can manage clients around the globe and see what's working and not based on the scientific principles of training right how do we create that into a database that now we can train new coaches and they can use those same metrics and tools to create programs that are tailored to fit person's individual needs right now how do we integrate that with um, a, assessment and clinical care assessment and, and and all these other pieces. So there's a lot of work in that. And so that's where Kabuki Strength is the genesis. But we have, we call our gym, the Kabuki Strength Lab. Mm -hmm. Literally, people find about our, our, our gym in the neighborhood. And they're like, how long have you been here? Why, why do I not know about this? We don't advertise our gym at mm -hmm. all. So they're like, that makes no sense. Well, that's because the only reason is to have a testing environment for the tools and methodology and having enough people to have the culture and fit and to be able to be part of the experiment. Mm -hmm. What about the environment of the, the feel of it, the actual gym? There's a, I don't know, a grunginess to it. <laughs> I recently became a member of Planet Fitness <laughs> <laughs> for, for reasons that have to do more with the heat in Austin that sometimes I need to put in time yeah. on the treadmill. Uh, I don't like that. I don't gym. have any judgment, honestly. I don't. The best gyms I've been in are kind of dirty. You walk in and you know that work is to be done. Yes. There's not another reason to do there. It is the the environment is tight. Mm -hmm. There's a big piece of that. Um I, I know it's studied sociologically, I believe. I just I just butchered that word too. Uh, <laughs> but uh but the intensity, when you start growing a space, the intensity drops. Yeah. And so I, I had that experience when we grew, we went from a 4,000 foot to a 9,000 square foot gym at one time. And everybody's like, it doesn't feel the same. Yeah. Like if people are complaining for years, we've shrunk it back down. Now we're down to 3,500 square feet. <laughs> and it creates that intensity. It creates the closeness, the connection with the people around you. And then, like I said, the, the grunginess, like you go in, you know the intention when you walk in that environment creates that tension. But when I speak environment, it's not just the, it's not the physical, it's the people. But you know, when the gym is a little bit beat up, yes, it also tells a story, like there's a history to it. You could tell that not only is there work to be done, that work has been done here. Yes. Like battles have been fought. There's something to that where you're just in a long line of people, you know, that have uh, fought and won. <laughs> and we could get into a whole nother space. So this would be a whole nother topic, but that existing energy of a yeah. space. I mean, uh, we mentioned offline Joe Rogan, he talks about the same with comedy clubs. There's certain there's certain clubs that just have a history. The, the, there's an energy there. You can get all woo woo, but you know, the, there, it, it's, it's there. A, it's a real thing, I think. You yeah. walk in and you can feel it. And you feel you it. You feel it. Yeah. That makes me feel that somehow all of us humans are connected in ways that's hard to describe, even the ones who are no, long, no longer here. Just the greatness that once was is still in the walls, in the space, present there. Yep. And we somehow can plug into that energy. Yeah, it's, <laughs> we can go down, a, go down a path there. There's something really powerful there. You've also mentioned a bunch of cool equipment uh, that uh, you've developed as part of uh, Kabuki Strength. Probably a little bit of that has to do with your engineering education, but also just generally with the spirit of the uh, innovator that you are. What are some cool, maybe uh, revolutionary pieces of equipment that you're particularly proud of or just uh, you, you've been obsessed with recently that you're yeah. developing? Love to talk about that. So and we've got some wild, crazy stuff that just came out and is coming out too. Mm -hmm. um, so everything that we create and release at Kabuki Strength the industry hasn't seen before. There's stuff that's basic foundational that's been around forever because it works. But there's always more. Mm -hmm. It could be better. And why are we not looking at these things, these foundational things? So when people are coming up with novel things, they end up being way different outside the perspective. And I'm coming up with things that are way different that are plays on what we mm -hmm. already know works. So we talked about the transform bar, the only bar in the world. We can manipulate spinal mechanics. 
we can, so everything, everything for me from a design concept that we develop is all about creating products that can rapidly accommodate to the variability of an individual's leverages, mobility, and training needs. Okay. And that's going to also create and distill down the size and scope of space that we need, which is going to be continue to be an ongoing thing. Check out my Instagram after this, and you'll see I put an entire gym on the bed of my truck and went on vacation <laughs> uh, uh, last week. We drove to the desert. Oh, no. That's and by so entire awesome. gym, I mean uh, squat rack, full complement of our specialty bars, a horizontal and vertical pulley system, handheld weights, mm -hmm. shoulder rock, like a complete, an entire gym in product that took up the space the size of this bed right here. That's incredible. Because of the design scope of what we have. Mm -hmm. So the cool thing is that so there's two other bars that fit our biomechanically sound barbell lines. We talked about the transformer bar. Mm -hmm. The other two are built on this thing I call playground physics. So we have these bars with handles that are off um, off parallel with the axis. Mm -hmm. So they've been around the market for a long time. One is a, a hex bar or a trap bar. Mm -hmm. Another one is a, it's a pressing bar with uh, the handles turned as well. Mm -hmm. And both of them suck. They're horrible. Anytime any lifter knows if you pick it up, it's going to break your wrist and crush into your face. Mm -hmm. And it just, it just doesn't feel good pressing, but it alleviates the strain on the wrist. So people use it for that reason. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the trap bar, same thing. It's always diving forward in your hand. So it's kind of limited. It's also limited in use um, because you can't, you could do a lot more with it. So these bars are really cool playground physics. So as soon as the center of rotation is on the same axis as the uh, center of mass and the handle is off center, you have, you have a teeter totter. Mm -hmm. So, and a teeter totter has a balance point but it's infinitely perfect. So technically you can never find it. So it's always gonna be sitting on one side or the other in a playground. And that's what these bars are designed. So you got in instability right here. You can't find the center. The bar is always trying to tip in your hands on the trap bar. So you can't do carries with it because you're doing forward momentum and it wants to, it, it wants to dip on you, right? Um, the Swiss bar wants to crush your face. Well, what do we do? We just make a swing, mm -hmm. put center of mass below center of rotation. Mm -hmm. And what does it do? Oh, it always finds center. So, so the handles on the, our pressing bar, it's arced so that the handles are above center of rotation. And then, and then every angle, instead of just being a certain fixed angles, each angle is based on the width, the average width of an individual. So the internal and external rotational bias is based of the shoulder is based on the width, mm -hmm. leaving just a little bit left because we talked about the lat being a stabilizer. You still need to have a little bit of cue of external rotation to engage mm -hmm. that as a stabilizer. Boom. Now, all of a sudden you have a bar and I kid you not, this is a great story. Major league baseball. When I presented it, every head strength coach for a major league baseball team, maybe not every, but damn near most of them have bad shoulders. They can't press. They've got shoulder surgeries, so on. And so we're showing, they love all our stuff. And I'm like, Hey, I've got this cool prototype. I want to show you. It's a pressing bar. And they're like, Oh, you know, major league baseball is a little hesitant on pressing because mm -hmm. the dangers for the shoulder. Yeah. And uh, I, I can't, I haven't been able to take a bar to my chest. I mean, I'd really love to. It's been five years since I've, I've been able to, uh, to XX train. And I'm like, just try it. Like, I can't even get a bar to my chest without pain. I'm like, just try it. Put it in there. Ooh, that feels good. Now, the arc makes it actually three inches deeper. Mm. So people are automatically scared. I can't do that because that's an extra range of motion, right? I'm like, oh, put a plate on there. They're doing it. By that time, the staff's like, they're all standing around. <laughs> you see like, what's going on? <laughs> put two plates on. You see the, just like, he gets up. How do you feel? Like, I feel fine. No pain at all. Yeah. I did this with five That's teams, awesome. with five of the, it happening repeatedly five times. <laughs> and that they, and every one of them worked up to two plates and did the reps varied with zero pain to a three inch greater, greater range of motion. Because what did we do? We stacked all the joints and we provided stability at the end. We balanced the internal and external rotation. I mean, just basic playground physics mm -hmm. and it changed the game. Now we get a greater range of motion with a greater training effect with the negative stresses removed. Our trap bar opened up one side, which there was already some like that out there, created, um, it pops up so you can pick up, take the weights on and off. It's got a built-in jack. Nice. And then created 
The high handle position, which already did, everybody uses the high handle on a trap bar. They just don't know why they like it. The handle that's on center, we offset just a little bit, not enough to make a difference on the range of motion lift mm -hmm. or even notice visibly, but it still has the same effect. So both handles now have that. Mm -hmm. um, we added the option of different handle sizes based on whatever your needs are, even a one that rolls to develop a uh, uh, grip, and then different widths that you could choose from based on whether you're training a teen athlete or a seven foot six NBA player or a NFL lineman, um, so that we can accommodate for all these uh, differences. And so, and then now it becomes the most functional all around bar around mm -hmm. because now you can do carries with it, you can do split yeah, squats with it, you could do curls with it because it goes around the body, you can do overhead presses because you don't have a thing that gets in your way and you can flip it up into position. You can do bent over rows and not run into your shins. You can do seal rows off of a bench. You can do ab rollouts. You could, should I go on? Yeah, so you could <laughs> use it as like the main the bar. The best multi purpose wow. bar around. You got a home gym, one bar. Like, how do you develop? totally new equipment like this? I uh, scratch it on paper, uh, maybe maybe weld some, cut up and weld up a prototype, but usually I just hand the scratched up paper to my uh, engineering manager. Mm -hmm. And that's what he says his job is to distill my chicken scratch into something real. Mm -hmm. uh, and then that team picks it up. Uh, but in the old days starting out, that's, I just walk out. I just walk out and do it. Um, I, you talk about engineering, I'm actually more, I work more of an artist fashion. It's in my head and I just go create. Um, I, with no plans. And so they have to pick that up and actually do the engineering and testing and all that. And then we got two other products came out this year. Freaking wild. They're, are you familiar with uh, training with a flywheel? Uh, no, what's a flywheel? Maybe um, I am. A flywheel is a spinning object that uh, creates an inertial mass. Yeah. I and then it, it reverses direction. Yeah. So whatever you put into it, and there's ones out there, um, but ours is the first uh, patent pending that's all everything all in one unit. So it's a uh, floor based as well as a horizontal. So you can basically do any pulley movement in the world. And now everything that you put into it on a concentric force, it whips right back as, uh -huh. a, as, okay. as peak so concentric like a, load. Gotcha. So there's an and then accelerating it's whipping motion. It just, yeah, basically. Yeah. I mean, okay, I have to, I'm, I have trouble imagining exactly many of the things you're describing, I, I suppose, have to be experienced, right? Yes. So it, it's, there's a magic it's to and there's a lot of research they've been around. They're adopted more heavily in uh, Europe, quite heavily in Europe, but not as much in the U.S. Um, because they sell them as a be-all, end-all tool, which they're not. They're crazy for what they do, but it's not the. It's another tool, and so we have um, a very high quality unit now that is half the cost of everybody else's because the innovation of a movable mount point that you for them you have to have two pieces of equipment. We have one. So, um, and then a few other things, better platform to be able to do things and that we can do off, what we call off platform work, mm -hmm. which allows us to do movements like uh, punches and, and stand ups, things like that. And then I've got a handheld weight coming out next month that we can actually play with. So um, varying the load with it never leaving your hand by changing the leverage point. And uh, so what, what, that, we what, what uh, exercise are we talking about here? Anything that would be a, a dumbbell or a kettlebell movement. So it functions, it does the function of a kettlebell, a dumbbell, and what we call a center mass bell, as well as provides variable loading within a range. So how can you change, like, how can you change the load? Because load, well, we don't actually change the load. We change the torque on the, on the joint that we're working, which is the same. That's actually what is creating the force, right? So gotcha. if I'm doing a front raise, it's where this this downward force is times the distance away, right? Mm -hmm. uh, which also then makes it no force when I've got it at the bottom of the front ways, which is why it's so easy. Mm -hmm. With this, it's like a kettlebell, it's offset, except it has three different handles, mm -hmm. um, but it's offset just at a kettlebell, you can't do it because the offset so far, it becomes a wrist movement. So ours has three different sizes and the offset just enough so that you can pick, if I put it in a front raise position or a curl position, I could put it in an outward position. Mm -hmm. And the force is almost what it is at the, at the top, but then I get to the top and it's the same exact or the curl. So I can actually change the force curve in the movement. And then I can just release the pressure a little bit and let it swing into position and keep doing a drop set with never letting it down. Yeah. yeah. So wow. it's got a really nice texture grip that allows you to hold it in different positions. Mm -hmm. And then the load offset is just enough that it doesn't overpower the wrist. And then you got different hand sizes so that you can maximize this relationship and hit whatever joint that you're applying. That so, sounds incredible. It's really freaking, How the well, it's awesome because you can, because of the variable load, now I could go straight from front raises to side raises or rear or curl yeah. because- Without like putting Because it I don't down. have to put it down. So now my time under tension yeah. goes through the roof. 
And by the way, same effect with the flywheel trainer because the variable, res- whatever you put into it is what it kicks back. Mm-hmm. Um, so you have an, an constant time under tension because there's no rest points either. So all this stuff is working on maximizing time under tension, um, which anyway, it, it, it's That's cool, cool stuff. And anyway, I get, I get, I get excited. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, let me ask you about another thing you've already mentioned, but I find this really interesting, which is barefoot running and uh, um, your sort of uh, company, Barefoot Athletics. Yeah. Uh, B-E-A-R. And the tagline is optimizing the human to ground interface. We've talked about this a little bit with uh, the power lifting. How do you think about the the foot ground interface. It's interesting that we know that we should train all these parts of our body to be able to be stronger, be more resilient, like, but we think that the foot is different, that we need to package it and modify it. And somehow that that's the science of making, you know, it healthy. Mm -hmm. Um, Where I challenge people, think about that, like, First thing you do in the morning is roll out of bed and put your weightlifting belt on and wrap it on tight and wear it till you go to bed at night. Do it with your shoulders, your knees. Put it, wake up and put some knee wraps on, okay? And elbow wraps and see what happens. One, you'll get weaker, you'll lose movement capacity and you'll start affecting other areas of the body very negatively because they will start picking up the compensation for those joints that are not moving properly. This is it. What shoes are for is to protect you from the environment, from cuts and abrasions and heat and things like that. But the foot, let me, the mind blowing is like every other area of the body. You need to use it and you need to strengthen it and you need to learn to control it. That's it. That's all I have to say about the subject, okay? (laughs) It's that simple, but somehow we have been sold entire industries, like the orthotics industry. It's completely false. Meta analysis of the data shows that orthotics do nothing beyond temporary relief from pain over a six, eight week period of time and provide no long-term benefit. And I can't tell you how many people I've eliminated back or knee or hip pain from getting, from working on strengthening and controlling the foot and ankle complex. We believe we've villainized and said, a low arch is a condition that needs fixed. Mm-hmm. Like, when it really is just controlling the foot and ankle complex and how they relate to each other and how we use that. Is it like, go put on boxing gloves in the morning and do that for the next 20 years and see what happens. It's not about finding the right shoe that fits because your foot has been deformed. And so I'm not like some wacky guy, like, oh, you gotta be barefoot forever or do this. Like, no, I'm just saying, go spend some time using it. Mm-hmm. Strengthen it, learn to control it and you will work better in a shoe. But the whole running shoe movement with the raised heel, that was the person that that suggested that that in to Nike way back when they were trying to figure out what to do, the reason, and he says it's it's the, the worst thing that he ever did um, because we were coming from an era of people wearing heeled shoes, which by the way came from um, stirrups way back in the day. That's where the whole heel came from is to go into stirrup, but then it went into fashion. And then the running craze started coming around in the 70s they're, uh, they're starting to push this to the general mass population and they realized that they were causing injuries and like, what are we gonna do? Well, that's because everybody was in this position and had a shortened, uh, shortened calf muscle. And it's like, well, the workaround, let's just put a heel on it so we don't injure them. That's it. Yeah. And now because the raised heel, you gotta raise the toe. And then now with that, if you go stand on something and pull your inner toe in and uh, in a squat position, just reach down and do it, you'll see that you have no control over internal and external rotation of your of, of of your leg, you don't, and or your foot, and you actually have to put a support in mm-hmm. for the arch to be able to passively control those structures. It's just band aid on top of band aid on top of band aid. Use it, strengthen it. If you want to wear some shoes because they look good or fancy, I'm like I have no problem. I mean, I, I go out on a wife. My wife will put on some high heels every now and again. Like, but all I'm saying is use your foot. My thousand pound squat, my thousand pound deadlift were done barefoot. I'm not trying to sell you shoes. Mm -hmm. Go do it with no shoe. That's what I've been promoting. I did that for six years and I promoted it. But people ask me like, well, what do I do? Because my gym requires shoes. (laughs) Okay, where do I go? And uh, and then I go, well, 
you know, you could pick up these uh, other finger shoes or whatever, and they go, man, my wife won't have sex with me if I do that. <laughs> and I go, I know, mine either. Like, trust me, I'm not making this up. Everybody in that market markets to one segment, and they're still missing some gaps because they they still have a little bit too narrow of a, a toe box. And if you're lifting, you have the opportunity to really get that splay and start working on this stuff better. So um, I just wanted to create a shoe. These ones are odd colored because uh, it's a partnership with Kabuki. Normally, we've got a black or a gray, uh, low top, high top, sticks to the ground for lifting so we can do that. Mm -hmm. And very pliable. It's a moccasin. Mm -hmm. It's a modern day moccasin, but looks okay that you can wear it around in other areas if you, if you so choose. Like... Do you know what the number one healthcare cost in America is? What's that? Diabetes, mm. uh, heart disease, cancer, low back pain. Hmm. Now, what do you attribute low back pain to? Well, it's attributed to a lot of things, um, but inability to control spinal position, um, which starts happening from uh, some breathing issues. Uh, it also happens from the foot. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of stuff, but did everything that I do actually focuses on improving this. Yeah. Uh, so uh, that, and it all starts with the th This is one thing. Like yeah. this doesn't affect breathing, but um, so it does actually affect breathing to some extent and spinal stabilization. So the raised heel and toe will make you stride further mm -hmm. um, because of just how it operates. Mm -hmm. But that overstride is a result of opening this. Mm -hmm. So we open the pelvis and diaphragm. Did we talk about that and the impact that that has for mm -hmm. controlling and spine? Yeah, yeah, I think we touched on that. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it, it's all this stuff plays together. So the gate affects that. And so the shoe affects the gate. And then, so it's all connected. All connected. Let me be very purposeful with some conversation here though. Sure. We've talked about periodization. This was a big gap. So, um, people go, well, yeah, well, when people started running with those, they started having injuries back when, uh, the finger, uh, company produced those and didn't do the education around this very simple concept. Yeah. You do not walk into the gym if you haven't squatted and start squatting 225 from, yeah. from max Rex every week day or every day over day. Yeah. And that's what people did because they did weren't told that you need to build the capacity to do this. You go wear these and walk around in your office or wherever all day long, your feet are going to hurt. They're going to be sore. Do it for 10% of your time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do that for a month, then add some. That will build the capacity to do this. And then that's going to start having the ability to strengthen, manage the foot. And there's a whole lot of other stuff. I've got videos on things that you can do. Mm -hmm. Buy whatever you want or just, just spend some time out of them. Like... That's all that I want people to do because it is so simple and it has such a profound impact. Yeah, it does. I What I did- uh, I, I noticed when you walked in, when I walked in, I was like, oh, hey, you're spending some time without the without shoes on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, what I did, um, I think it's already now two years ago when I was doing a lot of running, I do like a 10 mile run. I would take my shoes off for the last like half mile and I run like that. And that was for me really helpful to ensure that I have proper form form that minimizes pain on the way I run. I still like shoes. I benefit a lot from shoes, the protection they provide, but mm -hmm. it's uh, yeah. for running um, we're referring to, uh, especially trail running and so on. And in the city when there's glass and all those kinds of things. Uh, but it's really important to have minimal sort of protection on your feet. For me, at least it was to figure out the ways that my form basic movement and like the positioning in the foot, the impact of the foot and everything, you know, the the the, the lower leg, the, the entirety of the torso really, how it's improperly positioned in terms for the objective of minimizing pain. And the barefoot running really helped uh, fix yep. that for me because I figured out that I need to take uh, shorter uh, steps, uh, more frequent, you know, all, all those kinds of things. And that really helps you figure that out. Like, let's be realist about stuff. Like, yeah. um, Spend some time using it, strengthen it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've got some great ways to, to do that and learn how to do that. So, yeah. What is a good diet for strength development? I've, uh, just to give you some context, I've been eating mostly meat, not for strength, mostly for mental performance. I just enjoy it. Yes, you need to have a base level of protein building blocks for tissue, right? We need to have enough fats to be able to have hormones work and key processes in the body. We need to have 
Well, you don't need to have from a performance aspect carbohydrates necessarily because the other ones can convert into injury sources. But for a performance athlete, carbohydrates can be very beneficial uh, as well. So, um, so I look at it as you want, you need a base level fats, you need a base level of proteins, and then you adjust the carbohydrate intake based on the needs. I'm not anti-carbohydrate by any means. Um, because a lot of people, well, they look at me now when they see like how lean I am and they, they jump to a conclusion. You must be keto. You must be carnivore. You must be whatever. And it's like, so losing and gaining weight is simply eating less or eating more. <laughs> I mean, it, ah, uh, and it, we yeah. get so complicated. Oh, that my fat, like, what's your fasting window? If I'm, if I'm doing fasting, it's just because it works with my, my environment. Sometimes I do it. Sometimes I don't. Mm -hmm. All that does is control how much calories that you take. Big success with keto and carnivore diets. It's hard to eat a lot uh, and and put on weight with those with those diets. Mm -hmm. um, you know, protein actually has a thermogenic effect, and so you have to have a massive amount of fats if you have a only meat diet because you can literally starve to death. There's a there's a, a show where they put people out in the wilderness, and this guy, the one that won one of the ones I looked at, they threw him way like up in the uh, a past a lot, you know, out the way out there, there was nothing, but he somehow got a caribou and killed it. Mm -hmm. And he still lost a pound a day for 30 days with a caribou mm -hmm. because his fat was stolen by a, uh, uh, and, and he could eat all the meat he wanted. Yeah. And they, he almost got pulled because his weight That's loss, right? Um, but that isn't actually a performance. So those type of keto and carnivore are not performance diets. So they're not going to be as effective at supplying. Uh, the energy needs for high capacity training. So don't get me wrong, you can do training, but like you can be a successful like elite uh, athlete with a with a vegan diet, but it's not as easy to do it with other diets. So, uh, and you're missing some base nutrients. So many nutrients in meat. I believe uh, having greens in your diet is really beneficial. Lots of research, but there's people in the other worlds that argue that you don't need them, but they help clear organs, provide micronutrients, all this sort of stuff. So I eat simply a whole well-rounded diet and I've gone from, I can go from 285 pounds squatting a ton of weight to eating less and dropping all the way down to, you know, seven, 8% body fat with veins standing out everywhere without a tissue on me, just with amazing, great tasting food. Mm -hmm. To lose weight or be healthy does not mean that you need to eat flavorless, bland food. Mm -hmm. So that's the main point I try to portions, get across. It's eat less to lose weight, eat more to gain weight. Yep. Make sure that you've got enough protein. Make sure that you've got your micronutrients covered, which is going to cover by eating real food. Don't go low fat, no fat. If you want a performance, don't go no carb. But if it works, any of those things. So diet approach. When you look at diets, understand that they're how aggressive they are. So like keto can make you lose a lot of weight. Carnivore can make you lose a lot of weight. Um, a lot of that upfront is actually dropping glycogen stores. Mm -hmm. uh, so you're actually just reducing water in your muscle and fat tissue. Um, so, which is why it doesn't, isn't as great for a performance diet, but understand that every diet also has a level of discipline and does it fit your lifestyle? Mm -hmm. So I suggest people don't find a diet you need to find a lifestyle because that's what's sustainable. I hate the word diet to begin with. Mm -hmm. What behaviors are sustainable? And then do that. And then over time, the things you'll get to where you need to get. Mm -hmm. Diet itself, just by the name of it, is not sustainable because it, it is a short-term thing to get somewhere. Yeah, I tend to try to measure it because I definitely have a love-hate relationship with food. I tend to look back and say like, by following this particular protocol, lifestyle, whatever, uh, what was the level of happiness? <laughs> yes. So not like weight loss or weight gain or all those kinds of things. It's the entirety of the picture. Productivity, just feeling good throughout the day. Socially also like yeah. interacting with people because so much of uh, human connection, like I mentioned before is over food. And if you're going to limit yourself in that regard, you're, you're limiting a certain fundamental aspect of life. A uh, number of years ago, um, I did uh, like 20 to 
22 hour fasts every day. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, well, this doesn't work. I'm, I can't do business lunches and stuff like that. So when I was in my fasting thing, I went to a 16 so I could have a light lunch mm -hmm. just for the social aspect yeah. of it and perform a little perform that. That's like, funny. <laughs> um, and then that's, that's why, and that's why like the typical bodybuilding, like the eight meal a day diet mm -hmm. um, has never worked for me because I've always been a very bit like trying to fit that between meetings and other stuff. Um, what that diet provides is it just, do you get less bloat and distension of a larger meal? But at the end of the day, you get the same exact results. Pick a lifestyle, live that. You can have really great tasting food. And that to me is the same thing. And, and this is why I'm like really hitting this point because also with the dieting and like the approach like, oh, I'm going to do this. And people pick these chicken and broccoli recipes. And guess what? You're going to break. If you do not, in, if you do not enjoy it, you will break. Mm -hmm. So it's, it is a very important point. Well, I also slightly push back or maybe to elaborate, if you don't enjoy moderation, for me particularly, um, I have trouble moderating certain things, most foods, I would say. So my source of happiness comes with foods, even if they're bland, the ones I can enjoy, but enjoy moderation. So there's, I mean, I enjoy every piece of food. So it's like, it's uh, if you can enjoy the the full lifestyle, it's not just the particular experience, but like mm -hmm. the full journey. Yep. Does it fit your lifestyle? Yeah. Yep. So let me ask about uh, a complicated uh, topic that's sometimes a bit controversial, which is steroids. And maybe uh, TRT, testosterone replacement therapy. What role does that play in strength training? All right, we're gonna uh, we're gonna go there. <laughs> yeah, let's go um, there. Yeah, but it's an important discussion to to have. Um, I think that uh, it's something that I can be more transparent on. Um, in my past, I wasn't able to uh, due to the career that I had. So just like covering that stuff in a you know on a on a public forum uh, when you're highly looked at uh, being an executive for recruiting and other stuff like. It was an area I had to just kind of uh, <laughs> pass on, right? Yes. Now, <clears throat> I've used steroids. Um, I've used them since I was 33. Uh, and uh, I basically just use TRT now uh, after my big squat. So for 10 years, I used them. And there's some interesting uh, components to this. So um, one is just the the gray area of what we call performance enhancing supplements. So uh, performance was a PEDs mm -hmm. um, that the line of what defines a PED is ever shifting and it's shifting based on society norms, cultural norms, government body agencies, all these sorts of stuff. So I'm not making excuses here. So I just want to elaborate before I actually start digging into the details here because performance enhancing, I could take sodium bicarbonate and enhance my ability to perform deadlifts for reps. Guess what? I did that for my Guinness World Record for deadlifts in a minute, okay? People do it for rowing or other, they use high capacity uh, type stuff. It is performance enhancing. It is a chemical. It is baking soda, all right? Mm -hmm. um, they're not able to make it illegal because they everybody eats bread. <laughs> well, not everyone. And so it's a little hard to test for. No matter what you do at any level, so that's an extreme example, mm -hmm. but other examples, um, you're drinking a, um, an energy drink in that mm -hmm. uh, cup there a little while ago. Mm -hmm. And in America, you can get an energy drink with 240 milligrams of caffeine in it. Mm -hmm. In Canada, that's too dangerous. You can only get 140, but you can go buy ephedra. Mm -hmm. And ephedra is illegal in America. And so these things bounce back and forth all the time. I could take Yohimbi, and in Europe or Australia, it is a drug and classified. In America, it's it is not. It's a it's an herbal root, uh, and a lot. I actually have one one of my supplements, except for the overseas version. Um, <laughs> anyway, the, the point I'm getting is, no matter what you do, at some point, there's by someone's standards, you are cheating. Mm -hmm. And because it is, you're taking something that 
but you could work around these things with nutritional ways or other ways versus taking a chemical strip. And there's a whole lots of ways to do this, but it's like, oh no, it's steroids. It's not, it's injectable or it's not. Well, somewhere there's a culture or a person that will say you're cheating no matter what. So it's a self-defined, you need to define it for yourself unless you're competing in an organization that has testing, mm -hmm. then it's a straight ethical uh, thing. And it's either right or wrong, in my mm -hmm. opinion. That's that's kind of the the overall dilemma of it is if you want to see what you're totally capable of, you have to decide decide yourself what's okay or not to mm -hmm. to that level. There it, is no there is no body that can say something yes or no. Yeah, um, when there's an event like the Olympics, maybe then you have a standard that you're all trying to adhere to, and then it makes sense to keep a, a certain, like to be within, there's an ethical there's imperative an ethical. So there. I, yeah, I'm not talking about th that. I'm agreeing to compete in this by these, by these rules. Yeah, right? but when you're trying to maximize your own performance, whatever that journey is, whatever that goal is, that's a different story. And it's not, it's not easy to figure that out. You go up, oh, you're, you're just like dancing around the subject, whatever. Well, Guess what? I've got a I've got a prescription for growth hormone and testosterone. Mm -hmm. It's legal for me to take. And you know what? A lot of the people that are in front of the camera in the media, politicians and news people, and the people that are there saying the the no drug stuff, they're going to anti aging clinics to look better, and they have a prescription for growth hormone and testosterone themselves. But in their eyes, it's okay. It is a prescription from their doctor because they have the money to do it. Mm -hmm. So it's legal and it's fine. If I, it's interesting in Oregon, uh, anybody, and I don't know what other states, um, over the age of 16 can, without parents' permission, by the way, walk into a gender clinic and as a female and get a prescription for testosterone. But as an athlete, if I've got low testosterone, I am so low, I've got depression, I can't have sex with my wife, it's affecting my quality of life. I will have to fight tooth and nail to get testosterone just as a prescription, and then I will get kicked out of my organization for competing. Mm -hmm. Like, so you understand what, how gray this stuff gets? Do you think the stigma on testosterone is the reason we're not having like a healthy conversation about when it's proper like what are the proper uses of testosterone in an athlete's life and just the regular human life? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and, and it's just, it's like anything. It's like I said, it is lines that it, we pick and draw. Anytime you put that out there, people are going to have different opinions of where those lines are. So now when it comes to strength, here's an interesting thing. In powerlifting, there's tested federations and non-tested federations. So we can literally look at the statistical data and actually find out what do steroids do? Mm -hmm. And so it's pretty clear that steroids provide about a 10% increase in strength on average over not. Now, that does take out the fact that steroids will put you in, uh, allow you to put on more mass, so you'll go up a weight class mm. a lot of times. Um, so as a whole, you could definitely lift more probably than the 10% over time, right? And then we think about steroids as the ability to just put on muscle. And here's where things get uh, a little interesting, even with people that use steroids, is not understanding the neurological impacts that steroids have. Because mm -hmm. you could take some steroids right now and be tr stronger in 10 minutes. That's clearly not done anything, you know, from a physiology standpoint to make you stronger, but we have a tapped in neurologically to, to elicit those gains. And there's a whole lot that happens neurologically. Like how much yep. science is there in terms of all the different ways you could take steroids, which kinds of steroids, the timing, the the dose, the all of those things to develop the the neurological, the physical, the skeletal, like all all the, you know, you've talked with such depth about the science of strength building yep. in terms of form, uh, in terms of the equipment that you use. It seems like a component, you know, the use of steroids should be an equal level of scientific rigor when applying them. It, it is. Now, the research is harder to, to get um, because of what it is. Um, but there is a lot of research that was done when they were legal 
Um, so they were legal up and through the, uh, through, I think the mid eighties. And so a lot of the classical, um, high, high benefit to low risk, uh, steroids were studied. And then since then, there's a lot of like designer steroids or new steroids that have come up that don't have a lot of research around safety and risk and things of that nature. And we can't do that because it's, you know, because of the legality around these things. Um, but some of the stuff on the neurological function is really just understanding how that chemical structure uh, works and what it's doing to the neurotransmitters, what it's doing. Um, and so some of it is is really talking to people that have experience with it. Um, right. And the other is understanding those structures and what they do. The neurological component, I think, is more interesting than than most because the most steroids act through increasing muscle protein synthesis. That's how you add more muscle is they have an anti-catabolic effect and they have a muscle protein synthesis enhancing effect. So it reduces the amount of muscle that you waste and increases the amount of muscle that you put on. But the neurological component is, is tremendously valuable for what it can do for your training uh, workout. Like if I handle more load over time, I'm going to make more progress. If I can actually just stimulate more neurological effects for a specific event, it's going to have an impact, right? But there's other ways that you can tap into this too. Things that you can tap into mentally with great practice with meditation and other stuff that will have the same effect. People probably think I'm over speaking, especially steroid users that are listening to this. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I'm talking out my ass, mm -hmm. but I'm not. Um, because I, I, uh, I have experience with this stuff, um, on both ends. And some of those areas, a lot of people don't have, uh, the experience with that. What I've kind of heard from people is the, the confidence that comes with steroids. It feels like not to call it placebo, but it seems like the psychological benefits of steroids is huge and that you feel like, uh, there's a confidence that seems to be uh, coupled with the actual biological and chemical effects. I have a actually a neurological condition. Um, so I actually don't feel a lot of that stuff that people, cause there's certain steroids that like people will like, you're like very extreme ones, mm -hmm. um, like that would make somebody bite someone's ear off in a fight, for example. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Almost that, like aggression. That, and they'll literally do nothing. I'm like always just chilling. And mellow. <laughs> really? I don't like have a, <laughs> that's an great. effect. Uh, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but neurologically, they're still having those effects. But I don't get those feels that uh, yeah. other people uh, have from those. But yes, there's that immediate boost in uh, aggression and a confidence and stuff that come with a lot of those ones that deal on the neurological. Um, overall, a good sense of well being, just like from being on testosterone, like it's going to affect your mood. Um, and, it, and it's interesting. So testosterone replacement therapy, if we walk down that path now mm -hmm. and kind of switch gears, um, you know, we find that men today have declining testosterone over what has historically been in the past. So right now, I think a 35 year old testosterone is shown to be about half what it was, um, just 50 years ago. So I don't know if we could argue the point. We don't really have the science to validate any of it, but it could be uh, society as far as the impact that it's having on the mental uh, health uh, for men. It could be the the estrogens floating around in the water from all the chemicals and birth control and all this sort of stuff. Could be a lot of things, um, but it is a fact that average testosterone is significantly lower. And that is going to end up affecting life, quality of life, as well as your longevity, mm -hmm. um, because it will affect those things. But on the other end, steroids and TRT, particularly steroids, come with a lot of negative health benefits. Not benefits, a lot of negative health ramifications. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, yeah, if I knew what I know now, I don't know that I would have gone that path. I didn't, I didn't until I was 33, which is kind of an outlier for a strength athlete. Um, I was... I was a four times body weight deadlifter, 800 plus pounds at uh, uh, 198, and it's pretty dang strong uh, mm -hmm. before I went down that path. Uh, and that's because I wanted to see what I was capable of, but I was reaching a point that it was either I need to do that or not. My testosterone, my natural testosterone levels were actually, um, I think below 300 is actually the threshold. So I was being 
told to go on TRT for the last couple years, mm -hmm. probably just because I was pushing so hard and the stress level was driving my test down. So it was self-imposed mm -hmm. more than likely, mm -hmm. but I put it off because I wanted to set all the drug-free records and I set the ones that I wanted. And then it was 33. I'm you know, entering the age category and I'm like, I'm going to go on TRT. I did not feel like I should be with TRT. Personally, my ethical standard was I shouldn't be competing in tested events anymore. Um, there are federations that will allow you with your, you show up with your script and you do your test and you're below a certain level, but you're still on. Mm -hmm. which, but for me, I'm like, that's not okay. You so I'm like, I may as well at this point use steroids. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, since then, you know, understanding all those ramifications, uh, you know, I might not have gone down that route quite so fast and easily, but I continued because I also have a lot of resources that other people don't and being able to assess and understand and put things in place to mitigate that. So you need to be, and the other thing is once you go on, it's literally a decision for life. Hmm. Not in this, but realistically is because your, your quality of life, your feeling is going to be enhanced quite a bit and you're not going to want to go back. And if you go back, it's going to be less than it was before. Mm -hmm. uh, that's how the endocrine system works. There are ways to try to recover and bring that up, but it mm -hmm. might be a while. Mm -hmm. And if you've been on for a while, it definitely is not an option. Mm -hmm. So those are big things that people need to understand that you're going to have some things in there. And even TRT has some potential, especially with, at higher levels, that it's going to you know, increase the risk for prostate cancer. It's going to potentially cause some uh, hypertrophy of the left ventricle of the heart and some potential plaque buildup of the, some of those key arteries around there that's going to have an impact on your cardiovascular health. There's things that you can do mm -hmm. again, but everything is like the shoe story, right? Where I'm anti, anti shoe, but I'm going, well, we could put band-aids on this. Yeah. Um, so it's, uh, <laughs> But there's a quality of life that comes with it, the increase in quality of life. And if you do it correctly, I think... I, for, I guess for, me, I, for me, I definitely would not live without TRT, even with knowing what I know now. Um, at this age and the quality of life and being able to be there, have the energy, the recovery, um, that's a big thing where all this, though, I talked about uh, muscle protein synthesis and uh, anti-catabolism as being big drivers, but recovery is the other big aspect mm -hmm. uh, that they that they offer, probably as a result of those, but um, that's gonna, th those are gonna be the big enhancements. So um, just doing steroids, steroids is going to increase all the other stuff that you do. So if you've if you have good training, you have good diet, good quality of sleep, like all this other stuff, then you can take advantage of that. But you could shoot steroids and nobody would know. Mm -hmm. yeah. And honestly, you go down to 24 hour fitness and you'll see a bunch of, you know, late, you know, 19 to 21 year old kids that are all kind of red and 150 pounds that look like that don't look like anything. Yeah. And they're a bunch of them will be using steroids because the, yeah. they're not like, so it's, it's not the. It's not going to make a champion. Like you said, ten. It's not going to at most. Guess what? I was already at an elite level. I was one of the best in the world before I started using. Mm -hmm. It doesn't. It doesn't do that. It does a ten percent increase at best. Yeah, and that's proven in the statistics, which is interesting because most people don't know this. Like, it. It the data is right there. Yeah. Yeah, and that's why I'm often saddened by maybe. Um, the negative view of somebody like Lance Armstrong, who's I, one of the greatest that, athletes in history. And everybody else that he was competing against, I'm sorry. You, yeah. I, I hate to blow anybody's bubble, but regardless of I told you my ethical uh, pieces with saying that you're gonna be at something at an elite level, you look at most, a lot of those big figures out there, when the, their income and your life relies on it, yeah, you're gonna push those limits. So maybe I, maybe my ethical would change if 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 I was in that position too. Because here's the thing: what I believe, like someone is, I think people should avoid steroids. Um, TRT probably something worth taking a look at what your levels are when you're in the 35 to 45 range and see what decision you decide to make from there. And that's a decision that you make for the rest of your life. The only times that you should be taking a look at steroids is if it's it's funding your life. It's creating that it is your job and it's doing th like, and honestly, it, it was for me. Like I, so was it the only thing? No, 
No. If you want to get into neurology, uh, neurotransmitters and uh, alcohol, there's a really interesting discussion on performance enhancement. Um, so when I lift heavy, um, and so I always promote it like not more than a drink or two, like once or twice a month is what I, all I'm talking about when I'm, mm -hmm. when I'm saying this. What's so the, like what's the timing of the drink that we're talking about? Uh, it's about three to five minutes. Before? Yes. And we're talking about beer? It doesn't matter the, uh, the source. So um, I shots are the easiest. You want something that is not going to have some sort of regurgitory yeah. effect or bloating effect or anything like that. Um, but you want to have the quick hit of energy. So it's a preferential energy source moves above ketones, carbs, everything. Mm -hmm. uh, it's seven calories per gram. But then there's some really interesting things that happen. Spikes blood pressure, which is going to make weights feel lighter. So when you're in your early 20s and you're trying to hit up, you know, some attractive person at the bar mm -hmm. and you're with your buddies and you're like, ah, you know, and you got second guess, oh, should I, should I? And they go, have a shot of liquid courage. And you have one and all of a sudden the, the second thoughts, the second guessing, all that drops away. Like you're focused in the moment uh, and you walk over and you actually perform a little better, like conversation wise than you normally would. Now, if you have five or six and then go over, you're gonna make a fool of yourself. So it's all about timing and amount. Yeah. But there is a reason that that happens. So anyway, I'm known for promoting this whiskey and deadlift concept. Um, I love this. But it, but it you're works. like the Eastern Bloc. Uh, so that's, where it came, that's where I stole it from because <laughs> I was watching all these Russian lifters would yeah. have a shot of vodka or something before they go lift. And I'm like, there is something here. Yeah. So I started experimenting with it. And I'm like, that works. And then I started researching. Nobody talks about this stuff. So it takes a while to start piecing together all the stuff that actually happens to make that happen. But it moves away the things that you're going to, the concerns about the ramifications in the future and the other stuff. So the, um, but brings you into the moment and then the, the, the dopamine hit and the other, and then it uh, enhances whatever mood that you're in. But all of a sudden you get in the state mm -hmm. much easier. And so it's really, really interesting, but it's very, it's a very small amount needed mm -hmm. and very time sensitive, but it can be so much more powerful than like drugs people use mm -hmm. for this stuff. Yeah. It ties really together with meditative state and other pieces to, to, to get you into that flow state. Those thoughts about failure, what if, what if, like all that you, you get into that zone, that moment, that time. Mm -hmm. Um, you, so you, anyway, so but, interesting, an alcoholic is promoting, al you know, uh, al no, but, but there's an important point here, which not often talked about. I think it is fascinating that because you can get into so much trouble with alcohol when used in excess, people don't often talk about the, the positive aspects of alcohol, even in your college years. It people, had a it had a lasting effect on who I am as yeah, a person. I don't think people I mean, are not, give enough credit to the positive aspect. See, you could have accomplished a lot of those same things with a little more moderation, which yes. I think people should talk but, about more. Which is like the the way to open up a personality, like the flowering of the full character and the weirdness and the 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 like the beauty of who you are as a human being could be opened up with alcohol, and that's really interesting to think about. You should try some podcasts. With a with a shot and and these <laughs> yeah I, you, you, and I actually open, I, I no, do this I, some, I do this sometimes mm -hmm. uh, with myself and guests and it will change the conversation it lubricates the the conversation yeah. definitely not the excess and which is what I learned because mm -hmm. I went all the way in because I do everything at extremes yeah so it was a really hard lesson that took me a lot of time to unwind but it it is interesting and people don't discuss those things because it's it's either this or this you're one of the greatest strength athletes of all time so it's worthwhile to consider how you optimize the the feats of strength that you reach for uh with things like steroids it's it makes perfect sense and i think <laughs> that was a from my perspective i think it was probably the right decision you've achieved something incredible that inspires a huge number of people that's it. And you've shown to yourself and to the world what the human body can accomplish. Yep. That's incredible. And no matter if I pushed to a less weight and if I disclosed everything that I did and I didn't, when I wasn't using steroids in my opinion, if we went through everything, there would be people that would say, you're using performance enhancing. Yeah. No matter what, like wow. it is, it's straight up. So you just need to be okay with it yourself. And so I had to make the call. I want to see what the true potential is of Every, let's throw everything out the window. 
that I feel, unless I feel it's a, a, a risk from a, from a health standpoint that I'm not willing to take on. And because that's, how do I, like, it's just yeah. picking and choosing. Yeah. And it's just picking and choosing. I, here's what I want to know. This is what I want to be able to try to achieve. And so, yeah, yeah, that's what I did. And, and what you did is incredible. Like it's it's just all inspiring. And You're what Lance Armstrong did was incredible. Yeah, and that and that and that ate me up. And what's funny is the people that bash him are like on the media or politicians or maybe some actors. And guess what? A ton of them are doing the same thing. It's hypocrisy at its finest. Trust me. But how uh, many how many of those figures you're watching in movies that love to talk, uh, uh, you know, be pol you know, be political and do this and the news and all this? I'm telling you, <laughs> they're there's anti-aging clinics like all over California and everywhere else. Who do you think is keeps them in business? Well, it's not the competitive lifter. I'll tell you that. Well, that's you're and speaking. they're using peptides and also <laughs> in SARMs and yeah. all sorts of like. But you're speaking to the hypocrisy. I also want to speak to the the fact you know somebody's a friend of mine, David Goggins. I don't know if you know who that is yep. ultra marathon runner, um, Navy SEAL. He gets pretty incredible person, yeah. Incredible human being, and he gets criticism like, you know, what you're doing is um, is bad for the body. You know, you're you're pushing yourself too far. I find that the people that criticize are often people that haven't truly pushed themselves to the limit. They haven't actually worked hard in their life. When you work hard, you realize how incredible it is that a human being can dedicate themselves so fully to an effort the way you did the way david goggins does the way the way the greatest athletes do and there's nothing that should be said beyond just sitting back in awe that humans can achieve that and that inspires me to do the best whatever the hell i do to be the, the best version of that there's something about like athletic feats especially like strength that just in, are inspired inspire us to do the best, uh, to be the best version of ourselves. I don't know. That's the only thing you should be saying as opposed to uh, criticizing some little detail of this and that. It's just an awe-inspiring well, that uh, you push yourself to, to anybody to that is at that level. And this is funny, like in competitive sports, like you go online and people, it's just bash, 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 bash. You go talk sure. to anybody, anybody, anybody that's a high level athlete within that field, and nobody has a single bad thing to say about each yeah. other. But all this chitter chatter down there, I mean, I know exactly what you're saying. Yeah. Like it's so if you, I, I would say, cause I have love for all, all those folks, especially when you're younger, you have a little bit of that uh, desire to criticize others. Like, I think that should be channeled in improving your own life. Anytime that you feel that way, that is when you need to turn inward. Yeah. And it's hard to do. But there is a reason that you have those emotions around someone else and what they're doing, mm -hmm. that you have an opportunity to look at yourself and know why you feel that way. And that, guess what? That's gonna be the hard thing to do. That's gonna be the thing, again, that's stirring you a little bit because it's so much easier to sit there and uh, or talk to your confidant or whatever mm -hmm. instead of go, why does that bother me? Yeah. Why does what that person doing or what that person's achieving bother me? It's like a difficult question that I often ask others, um, whether it's better to work hard or work smart. I like to ask that question because it helps me get a sense of the human being. <laughs> and I think I, let me just say like, I often, I often like people that answer that with work hard. Even though the, the quote unquote right answer is work smart, meaning like finding the optimal, efficient way to achieve a certain goal. I find that people that answer work smart don't actually find the optimal, efficient way mm -hmm. to achieve a goal. It seems like the people that at least uh, certainly early in life strive to work their ass off, even that means doing the inefficient, the dumb thing, just to learn the mistake, the spirit behind, the human spirit behind the person that says, or a card, 
is is the one I, I connect with, but I'm I'm torn, especially in the in the work culture in the tech sector where people answer work smart. What would you, um, <laughs> what what would you say about that tension? This, this definitely encompasses like I, I'm the intellectual and I'm the meathead. <laughs> I'm the work around the clock, yeah, and go fix the processes and make it so much better. Uh, type person, right? That's 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 me and a whole. That's everything. That's my life story, right? Mm -hmm. Busting your ass to find the easiest way possible. So both. <laughs> so, like, I will, I will build a custom hydraulic cart that will lift my plates up to the height of my my squat, mm -hmm. so that I can minimize. I roll it over next to it and then minimize the effort of it going on and off. Yeah. Nice. To be able to lift the most amount of weight as possible, yeah. 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 So, so that I can save the energy from here, from lifting those up and the fatigue of my back being in a bad position, so I can nearly kill myself over here. Yes. Right. I. <laughs> my yeah. my wife. Anybody will say I'm a workaholic. Yeah. And the the first thing that I would do when it would be <laughs> uh, doing a company a company turnaround, they'd hire me come in. And I would be taking over for someone that wasn't successful, but it was usually hardly ever for lack of want or trying. So a lot of times they knew they were unsuccessful and they were running around working six, seven days a week, 12 hour days, doing so much. And it'd be like, well, you need to do this. And they train me on like all the reports and this and all the things and like, good luck. Good luck. I couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. And the first thing I would do is nothing. I would do nothing because then I would find what actually keeps coming back, mm. the things that I need to do and how much of it was filling the space because so much of human nature when you're failing is to make yourself feel like you're accomplishing things. This is when things go on your list, on your checklist and you start like rolling up. So, are you running around just getting shit done? Yeah, yeah, yeah. being busy, right? Yeah. And so, yeah. So, but at the same time, like, find somewhere in my career something I've done where I haven't outworked everybody. Just so much on distilling things down to what's important. Yeah. And you've got to make time to sit back and assess and think and be introspective. You have to make time for this because if not, you're going to waste so much time sitting there walking sideways when all you got to do is move just one step in front of the other each day. Just one. That's all I say because it's going to add up. But you could spend six months knocking shit out, doing your routine, busting your ass and not take that one step. So you've got to distill stuff down. You've got to really understand like what's important to you in life and where you're going. And uh, when you're looking at anything in your life, the first thing that you need to do is figure out, do I need to do it? And just quit doing it. Just quit doing things in your life. Mm -hmm. And you'll see that a lot of stuff that you think has to be done doesn't have to be done. You'd be surprised. Mm-hmm. And then from there, this is the tech. Okay. And then of that, what can I, what can I automate? What can I not have to do in a repeated fashion? And then the last one, yeah, wherever possible. If it's not something that I'm adding tremendous value to, mm -hmm. like my uniqueness, people are like, oh, you must like do the auto work on your vehicles because you love working. I'm like, fuck that. Mm -hmm. I don't. And they're like, what? That doesn't make any sense. You and I'm like, no, I love creating things. Yeah. But I don't want to do that stuff. So you could use delegating if you're a manager position, but it's outsourcing, whatever, what, um, whatever it is. But there are also so many things. This and this this ties back to your point uh, around just doing it. There's a point to like experiencing all levels to really understand things. You need to spend time at the same time doing all those things because there could be good, huge, massive gaps in there that you're not aware of that are key for you or key to be having done different or so on. So um, like in my company days, I was one of the few executives that came in that could 
do anything on the floor from code to machine, run a lathe, a mill, weld, do nice. all, step into engineering, like, and, and that added tremendous value to me to having had spent time being a doer and not enough people want to be, you've got to just go do shit. Yeah. You need to spend time in your life chopping wood. Yeah, get you a lot to, of shit done, gotta, doesn't matter You gotta have experience yeah. trying and doing and do all these things that you would never, yeah. like yeah. my skill set is massive because I want to know, like you need to have those touch points. My job, my title is chief visionary. Mm -hmm. But I've spent time doing mm -hmm. everything. It's not about just like creating this amazing strategy or vision and I'm just gonna be there and this person that directs and like, like you can't be effective. You cannot connect the dots unless you've been in the moment with everything. Yeah, low level stuff. Sometimes it's doing stupid shit that you're not unique qualified to do than anybody could do, but you did it anyway. Just the training environment. Mm -hmm. People hit me up at a, at, a, at a school or wherever, like, hey, how do I get into, I wanna grow my grow my brand online. I wanna do this. Like, where do I, where do I start? And I'm like, go get a job at Planet Fitness or 24-Hour yeah. Fitness. They're like, but I wanna, you know, where, how do I get, you know, recognized yeah. and write articles and be an online coach? I'm like, you need to go spend yeah. a few years one-on-one -on -one training people yeah. to learn like the interaction, how people were, like, there's base levels you have to do. You've got to go work your way up from the ground. Yeah. I truly believe it. Well, I think that's the hard work piece that I, I'm speaking to that I like it when people have been humbled by the hardness of life. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like how difficult it is to do stuff. And it does, like, to oh, me, I'm I went and got my MBA. I went to MIT. I don't need to do yeah. that stuff. I'm above that. Yeah. Yeah. That that's once you've been humbled by doing those things, I feel like you can truly explore the, the optimization that you're talking to finding the ways where you're uniquely capable to add value to the world. And then, and then again, work your ass off to be the hey. best in the world at that thing. Yes. Uh, so it's always- But then don't waste your time on don't, yeah, shit exactly. that's not aligned. Yeah. And that's automate. the only, so that's, I guess there's a lot of context I put around that, <laughs> uh, but- Yeah, th that was like a long answer to, a, a long, beautiful answer to a unanswerable question. Do you have advice outside of all this discussion to young people today about career, about life? Since you've done so many things, you've- uh, overcome a lot of things, think high school, college student, thinking about what to do in their life. Do you have advice for those guys and girls? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> First is, you don't have it figured out, yeah. so don't worry, just jump in. Yeah. Um, yeah. We talked uh, you know, a lot about uh, understanding your values and aligning all that stuff, but you gotta have a base level of start exploring and learning and uh, just spending the time mm -hmm. doing like, pick something. <laughs> let, let, let me elaborate a little bit. No, you know what? A lot of people struggle with that aspect now because the choice, there's so much choice, it's difficult to pick something, but I think it does boil down to, you should pick something and don't worry about it. And then, but within that, you can start discovering the things that are there for you. Like I, I, I talked about, I made this huge shift. I threw away my whole life. I don't regret anything about that. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't be where I was if I didn't walk through and learn those things. And in fact, in the course of that, I learned just how much that inspiring people and helping them realize the potential far beyond what they thought was capable. And guess what? That was leadership 101 mm -hmm. in managing people base level, floor level, right? And I got a lot out that was perfectly aligned with what, and that's what I realized. It didn't matter um, what industry I was in or any of those other things, mm -hmm. but I was able, you can see so many things. There's so many paths that you can go down to help you realize what those things are. Mm -hmm. And you're going to be able to find a lot of those nuggets mm -hmm. and develop those. Do you think that I could have just at a, at a, gone to school and got out and started a, a globally recognized brand within a few years without having 
been schooled in business while getting paid for it mm -hmm. <laughs> by others for years. And in fact, that entire time, I knew that that's what I wanted to do, but I didn't go out on it. I mentored some of my friends along the same path to go, no, they're like, I'm ready. I'm ready to go do this. And I'm like, no, now you need to go get a job. You, you, yeah, you know, engineering, management, design, all that stuff. Go get a job as a, as a manager now. I'm like, oh, that's a step down. I can't do that. I'm like, go try it. A couple of years later, oh my God, that was such a good move. I didn't know what I didn't know. And now they're an executive for a freaking a Fortune 500 company. And the same thing, like I sat there knowing that I was getting a free education don't stress yourself out is my, that's my advice. <laughs> Don't stress yourself out that you've got to have this perfect thing because this process of understanding your values and the introspect, that takes time. You can get a job where you're getting paid to learn. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that's a good deal before you launch on your own. You mentioned um, going back to darkness. I'm Russian, so I like going back to darkness. Uh, <laughs> You suffer from depression, you consider it suicide. Do you uh, ponder your own death these days? Do you think about your mortality? Are you afraid of death? I definitely think about mortality. And am I afraid of my own death? It depends on the moment. Uh, <laughs> if I'm in the middle of a project, I definitely want to finish that project, man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, I don't fear it so much. I fear leaving my kids or my wife um, and not being able to be there for them. That bothers me. Outside of that, I know that I put everything into what I, the life that I've lived. Like you said, there's always more, but like I've lived hard. I've <laughs> loved hard. Yeah. I've, every moment in my life, I've made connections and impacted people around me for the better. And this tracks back, which is crazy when we were doing the documentary and they're interviewing people through my whole life and the consistency of the themes of anyone, like anything for Duffin, like just, sure, I'll fly in from Boston, all the, like these people, like all yeah. of, like, it was crazy. Like everybody had a story about me giving like yeah. just over and over and i didn't even really it's, it's just the way you were yeah. but i've been all in mm -hmm. i don't have like i have a lot more i want to do but i don't have things that regret have not done in like i don't fear it i don't fear it yeah it's like the i don't know if you know the bukowski poem go all the way otherwise don't even try uh, it seems like you embody that poem and you've accomplished some incredible things and serve as an inspiration to a huge number of people. Chris, you're an amazing human being. I'm really honored that you would spend your valuable time with me. Thank you so much for talking with me today. It was incredible. I can't wait to check out all the cool stuff you've engineered <laughs> with Kabuki Strength. So I'm uh, obviously, I love the, I love strength. I love strength training. I love the idea of strength. I love the, um, the equipment and the engineering approach that you take to strength. You're an incredible human, both on the things you've accomplished in terms of your own strength feats and uh, the kind of science and engineering you bring to the field uh, that many others could use. So thank you so much for talking today. Thanks for having me on. That was, uh, <laughs> that's quite the final thing. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Thanks for listening to this conversation with Chris Duffin. And thank you to Headspace, Magic Spoon, Sun Basket, and Ladder. Check them out in the description to support this podcast. And now let me leave you with some words from Arnold Schwarzenegger. Strength does not come from winning. Your struggles develop your strengths. When you go through hardship and decide not to surrender, that is strength. Thank you for listening and hope to see you next time.